Disclaimer, this video contains spoilers for The Stories of Sodor, Stories of War, and The SCPs of Sodor by Victor Tanzig. Parts of this video may be distressing for some viewers. Viewers discretion is advised. So, a while back, I made a simple video that I get maybe 10, 20 views at the most, but wow. That T1E2H3 video currently has over 6,000 views at the time of recording, which is astounding. I really do appreciate it. At the end of that video, I mentioned that I might do a Victor Tanzig timeline video to help explain his own series. A note I'd like to mention right now is that T1E2H3 had his series complete back in 2019, and it was entirely finished. Victor Tanzig is still updating his series. We know generally when the series ends, most likely in 2015, as we see Edward tell the stories of Sodor to the engines on the Brendan branch line. But Victor Tanzig hasn't finished the series yet, at the time of recording currently in 1965. A side note to mention as well here, Victor Tanzig's map of Sodor is very different to that of the Railway series, as will become apparent over the course of this video with some locations being in places that they probably wouldn't be. Events from the Railway series are also not canon in this timeline due to just historical things. There are some continuity errors though with that, as books featuring certain characters will be released before characters actually arrive on Sodor, so life imitates art I guess, but I'll explain that a little later down. Another side note I'd like to mention is all the character models are made by various creators such as Wild Norrester, Sodor Island 3D, Mainland Studios, Sudlion Railway, and many others to name a few but not Victor Tanzig. I have to put this here so the correct credit can be given to the correct pay. This is no shade towards Victor Tanzig, it's just that he wrote them that way, not created the character models as I have had some people claim online. Anyways, back to the video. There are five seasons currently ranged from roughly 1934 to 1965, with a sixth season still in the works, with roughly two specials and technically two spin-off series totaling roughly 87 episodes of content. There are of course lore dumps mentioned throughout the series, so I've arranged them into a linear order to better understand events for later seasons. I'll take a different approach than what I did for the T1E2 H3 video and actually discuss the, the episodes mentioned, as events directly flow into other episodes following a linear structure. You know, it's just because it doesn't jump all over the place with different characters at different times having different character arcs. <coughs> Croven. <coughs> I'll, also, I'll only be making this for seasons 1 to 5. Season 6 is in production from what Victor Tanzig showed in a community post recently, but that'll most likely come out in September or something, I don't know, so I won't be including it here. I might make a remaster of this video sometime in the future when the series catches up to 2015, because there'll definitely be some new lore dumps in, t in Season 6 and beyond, with new character backstories to explore and add to this timeline. I bet there's probably going to be something with like Donald, I don't know, you never know. Also, the SCPs of Sodor may not be canon to some people, as it is open-ended. But I, but I think that because of that, it could work and fit with the main t series seamlessly. So I will be including the events of that that take place, but I will mark them in their own separate chunk of the video to show that it may not be canon to some people. With all of that out of the way, sit back with a drink or food or whatever your whatever your preferences are. This is going to be a long one. Seeing as we're already about 4 minutes in at this point, I now present the stories the stories of Sodor timeline spanning roughly from the early years to 1965, with a few sprinklings from 2015 thrown in for good measure. Also some of these years are head canon explanations, as specific dates aren't mentioned with some of the events that happen in flashbacks. Our story starts in 1856, with the formation of the Sodor and Mainland Railway. In a workshop in Glasgow during the same year, the first recorded non-faceless engine was built, named Clive. Neil and Matthew would be built soon after being shipped to Sodor in the same year. The Sodor and Mainland Railway from Vickerstown to Crovens Gate was completed in December of, of 1857. In 1879, we saw the construction of the Harwick Tramway on the north of Sodor, hoping to connect the various towns around Harwick to the harbour. Toby was built and purchased during this time to help run the line. In 1882, construction of the mid Sodor Railway from King Ory's Bridge started and Duke was purchased for the line, being literally delivered in parts by horse and cart and being assembled on site. Also in 1882, the Sodor and Mainland reached Marin following the construction of the viaduct. The finances of the Sodor and Mainland Railway became low at this point, with the SNMs barely struggling for the next 30 ish years. 
In 1884, the slate mine on the MSR opened, leading to the MSR to purchase another engine, a small industrial engine called Atlas, who also helped out with the good works with the goods work on the line. Also in 1884, the Crovensgate Railway Company was formed, primarily to ship ballast from the hills to the expanding SM. Scarloe and Reneus were purchased in this year. In 1885, the Crovensgate Railway reached the town of Boxford, establishing the main ballast plant in the same year. Also in 1885, the Wellsworth and Suttery Railway was formed with the construction of Wellsworth Station in 1886. Adam, Lily and Colin were purchased for this line, extending the line down the Brendan Peninsula, stopping at Suttery and, and at Brendan itself, building the docks. The Wellsworth and Suttery also built the line over Gordon's Hill, known then as the Preston Incline, named after Nathaniel Preston, the owner and chairman of the WNS. In 1887, there was a huge storm on the island, causing flash flooding in the Ballast Quarry on the Crovens Gate Railway, trapping workmen on top of buildings and huts. Scarlowe was sent to rescue them, charging through the flood waters to rescue the workmen, at great risk to his own safety as the cold water made contact with his very hot firebox. The name change to the Scarlowe Railway following its heroism was undertaken in 1888, given, given it the name that we all are familiar with today. In 1891, Edward was built to haul passenger trains on the Furness Railway in, on the mainland. In 1896, Edward would be transferred momentarily to the western part of the line. While he was there, he met Sampson, mocking him for being an industrial engine only. While he was on this transfer detail, Edward took a long line of steel rails down the line, forgetting about the steep hill, quickly becoming a runaway. Sampson was nearby and with his very strong brakes, was able to save Edward. Approximately in 1901, Wyff was sent to South Africa to help with the Second Boer War, meeting and talking with Winston Churchill and Mahatma Gandhi. One day, the train of diamonds he was carrying was robbed by bandits, the diamonds never being found again for a long while. In 1902, the WNS expanded to Crosby, building the station on the main line. In 1903, the Crovens Gate workshops opened, quickly gaining a reputation for an excellent standard of work able to fix and repair any engines. Kyle Harrigan, one of the main businessmen financing the Harwich Tramway, whose wife Henrietta was fond of the railway. Henrietta was Spanish, teaching Toby a decent amount of the Spanish language during his time on the Harwich Tramway. Tragically, however, in 1903, Henrietta would die from influenza, and this led to Kyle neglecting the tramway, leading eventually to its closure in 1904. In 1904, however, the Ellsbridge and Knapford Railway was formed, being able to take up the opportunity to purchase Toby on the cheap. He was shipped from Harwood to Brendam, encountering some animosity from the WNS crew due to the fact that another rival company was being built on what would be their line if things had gone well for them. In 1905, Toby helped, helped to expand the line from Crosby to Ellsbridge. The e &K needed another engine, so commissioned the Crovens Gate workshops to build an engine, an engine that you may all be familiar with. His name was Thomas. Following the closure of the Harlech Tramway, the MSR brought the land, using the land to expand the MSR. Stewart and Falcon were purchased in 1904. From the lowlands, Stewart and Falcon built the, built the line, and from the hills, Duke and Atlas expanded the line, both ends meeting at Arlesdale in 1906. In 1907, the Furness Railway began to decline. The Furness Railway had been operating since 1844. Edward, Winston, and Albert were the only non-faceless vehicles on this line, with the exception of Samson, the privately owned engine on the industrial line. An opportunity to expand the Furness Railway was proposed, but unfortunately, while the investors were on the Furness Railway, a few accidents happened. The most serious accident involved the collapse of a rail crane onto a stack of dynamite, destroying a decent part of Dalton Yard. The investors were scared off by this incident that had happened, causing the Furness Railway to finance for bankruptcy in October of 1907. Albert was sent to work on the LBSCR, and Winston got sent to work on the Great Eastern Railway. In 1907, the ENK expanded to Knapford, purchasing Edward, who had recently come from the Furness Railway, of the same year. In 1910, Railgate Prison was built, designed to hold non-faceless vehicles for a maximum of 30 days, or 15 years for a certain engine as any more than 30 days would have a major impact on the railway the engine was from if the engine was in prison, unable to form, perform the duties of hauling revenue earning, earning trains. Also in 1910, Ivor Hugh joined the Scarlowe Railway, helping to expand the line for three years to the various towns and villages along the river, causing the SKR to become a fully-fledged passenger earning revenue railway in 1913. 
Wilbert Audrey was built in 1911, eventually becoming a clergyman. You may have heard of him. In 1914, the s filed for bankruptcy and Neil, Clive and Matthew were momentarily leased to a joint railway effort, and considering we were in 1914, I'm sure you can guess what happened next. World War I started in 1914, which was obviously a very bad thing, but it did do some momentarily good stuff for Sodor. The main line was to be extended through Tidmouth all the way to Arlesborough on the northwestern side of Sodor for defensive purposes, but that would take a few years to be completed. In 1915, the WNS would finish the construction of the China Clay Pits near Brendam. Also in 1915, a new rail line would be constructed from Lower Knapford to Knapford, with a tunnel going through the hills called Balahu Tunnel, later renamed to Henry's Tunnel. The previous line from Ellsbridge to Knapford would become the Loop Line, an alternate route if trains are derailed on the main line. Farmer McCall's farm is located on the Loop Line. In 1915, due to signalman error, Edward was on the same line as Adam, carrying a fully loaded passenger train. Brian, the WNS brake van, decided bravely to stay on the line, intending to slow and stop Edward. Edward stopped just in front of the barber shop, but the barber was not impressed. He almost levered Brian and Edward's faces with shaving cream for the incident when Jackson Bailey intervened, our first ever mention of him in this timeline, calming the barber and explaining the situation about how Edward just about crashed into them and was saved. I don't know, you know, that barber, he, he, he just ain't, he just ain't it. In 1916, the Knapford Harbour was constructed with the purchase of 10 cents and Drollam to help with general manoeuvres. During the construction, however, one of the keys was built on unstable platforms, leading it to sink into the harbour. Following the completion of the Knapford Harbour, Drollam was sent to work as a general tugboat for the Brendam Harbour while 10 cents stayed at Knapford. On the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway in 1916, James and his partner Amanda were working with munitions one day when James accidentally bumped a gun that had a live round in it. The round hit explosive trucks, killing Amanda and heavily damaging James. James would always have PTSD when he saw rail cars or any heavy equipment related to it. In the USA in 1917, Stanley was built at the Baldwin Locomotive Works, being shipped overseas to serve in the front lines in France. In 1917, as well, the lumber yard at Carlton was built, as well as the coal mine at Marston Heights and the start of the Farquhar branch. The Farquhar branch would be mainly built by WIF during this year, a governmentally owned engine. At Mont Sabir in France, the British fort came under attack and a lieutenant, a 24 year old Topham Head, who was a guard on Stanley's train one day, ran to a nearby gun emplacement, defending against the Germans for over an hour. Topham would be sent home on medical leave, however, from this incident as he had PTSD. The ship, the Lady Rose, would be torpedoed in a storm on its way to Sodor from France. The sole survivor, Sir Topham Hatt, would signal a passing freighter with a lamp that had been aboard. Topham Hatt would hold on to this lamp until he was sent to the hospital at Carlton. While on his way there, the lamp fell out of the coach after the train crossed over a dodgy crossing. Wesley Anderson was the main man who, run the, who ran the Carlton Hospital, notoriously running experiments on some of the soldiers to test ways to overcome mental illnesses, practices that would become banned after the war. Topham Hatt would be at the hospital till the end of the war, having been experimented on himself to get over the loss of the lamp that had saved his life and the PTSD he had received at Mont Sabir. In 1917, a bunch of dynamite was stolen the day before from a workman's hut on along the extinction to the Islesborough. Some German spies snuck onto Sodor, intending to blow up Knapford Harbour. The plot was foiled when a nearby truck saw the exchange happening, alerting the, the authorities. The lorry that was transporting the dynamite took off in a hurry, having to swerve around the lamp that had fallen onto the main line, crashing into the wall as a result. None of the engines knew where this lamp had come from, dubbing it the Lucky Lamp as it allowed the capture of the German spies. The Lucky Lamp would pass around the various railways on Sodor, always appearing at the right time. The Farquhar branch line would open for regular revenue earning service in 1918. The Standard Gauge Railway would reach Arlesborough in 1918, creating a through traffic route from the MSR to the NWR, boosting efficiency and profits for both railways. World War I would end in November of 1918. Towards the end of 1918, Neil was sent to the China Clay Pits, Matthew went to work at the lumber mill, and Clive helped to extend the Farquhar branch up to Renofa to form a new story stone quarry, which he would then end up working at. In 1919, Wiff was sent back to Barrow, helping to build the shunting yards and the scrapping facilities. Wiff was then assigned as Barrow Station Pilot. In 1919, Henry was built from stolen designs from Sir Nigel Grizzly, having too small of a firebox being unable to actually power himself. 
you know, a bit of a bit of a hodgepodge. You may have you may know of the story. Andreas was purchased in 1920 to work on the MSR as its designated express engine. In 1921, the Railway Act was passed, grouping all the out-of-control railways of Britain into four individual groups. These were known as the London and North Eastern Railway, the London, Midland and Scottish Railway, the Great Western Railway, and the Southern Railway. The Vicarstown Lifts Bridge was built towards the end of 1921, the same year that Mr. Starr and Mr. Zorro joined on the joined the railways. The ENK would be grouped into the LNER and the WNS would be grouped into the LMS in approximately 1922. The LNER crew were nicknamed the Nor'easters and the LMS crew were nicknamed the Middies, but I'll call them by just the actual names of LNER and LMS just for simplicity reasons, just for myself. In 1923, Gordon arrived on Soto for the LNER, as well as Arthur and Douglas for, for the LMS. In the winter of 1923, however, Arthur tragically died in an accident when he was trying to make up for lost time on a delayed passenger train, crashing at the base of the Preston Incline. The spirit is always said to haunt the railway whenever someone tells the full tale, always trying to reach his final destination on time. Following the death of Arthur, Donald was brought to Sodor for the LMS. Mickey was also brought to Sodor at this time, becoming the designated fire and rescue engine for the next 40-ish years. In 1924, Reginald arrived on Sodor for the LMS, as well as James and Henry for the LNER. In 1925, Patrick Clifton, a former worker from the former Sodor and Mainland Railway, now turned postman, was walking next to a train at the young lumberyard when Matthew would back down onto the train. Some of the logs had been improperly loaded, and so some of the logs would crush and kill Patrick. Matthew would suppress the memories for the next 40 odd years. In 1926, Napford Station was upgraded from two platforms to five, with a through line on the sixth rail line. In 1928, Duncan was purchased for the Scarlowy Railway from the Barnhill Railway following the closure of the latter railway due to poor finances and, you know, very dodgy dealings. In 1929, the stock market on Wall Street tumbled, causing the Great Depression worldwide. While the UK didn't suffer as dreadfully as the USA, everything became a bit tight, notably on the railways. Soon the big four were effectively fighting for contracts for certain trains and construction projects hoping to get by in these trying times. Also in 1929, the fuel depot at Lower Knapford would be built. In 1929, Henry was given the chance to try and pull the express. Needless to say, there is a reason why he mainly does goods work from now on. In 1930, the Tidmouth Dairy at Tidmouth was built, well, yeah, well, duh. In 1931, Bruce was built by Walter Paxman, an experimental locomotive powered by a diesel engine, different to the traditional steam engine. Duck and Bruce, as he would be called, would, be wor would work on a branch line shared by the LMS and the GWR as Bruce learned to lo learn the ropes of shunting. Bruce would rule the yard with an iron fist, however, when Duck was out of earshot. Following a few incidents involving a truck being smashed down a hill and Bruce's diesel engine failing, his iron grips began to slip. It got to the point where the truck sang a song teasing Bruce about being a diesel, simply just calling him Diesel. The name soon stuck, and this is what I'm going to call him now for simplicity reasons. Diesel would be purchased for the LMS operations on Sodor, becoming the only diesel engine on Sodor for many, many years. In 1933, an outbreak of mad cow disease caused Joey to come to Sodor, being tasked with ensuring no infected cattle would be transported to market. And with that, that is the entire kind of general background to this series. Now we now get to the main chunk, covering the events from 1934 to 1965, which is very, very large in terms of content, so I'll try and condense down the episodes, but it will take a while. I'll, just not, I'll mark events of significance, but I may gloss over some certain bits. Some of the years are unknown specifically, so I'll be guessing on historical and general hints in the episodes themselves. In 1934, Percy arrived for the LNER, becoming the shunter for Knapford Station. Within his first week, Percy had a few troubles around the Duchess contract. Due to the context of the Great Depression, the LNER and LMS basically fought each other for these contracts and revenue from companies upon successful completion. Thomas, James and Percy were the only engines available to call the Dunchless contract for the LNER, but with meddling from Diesel throwing Colleen the truck into the back of Percy, the contract was given to the LMS. Percy thought he was to blame, but due to a witness in the form of Duck from the GWR, Percy was acquitted of any wrongdoing and stayed with the LNER. 
Diesel would get 15 days in Railgate Prison for throwing for throwing Colleen into Percy. You know, I think Diesel, I think at the end of this, Diesel gets like 100 days in Railgate, so keep a note. The British Union of Fascists was formed in 1930, 1934, dedicated to spreading the fascist ideals from the, new, from the then newly elected Adolf Hitler as Chancellor of Germany. Roughly six months after Percy arrived on Sodor, Mr. Starr decided that Percy was capable of being shown how the, how the Farquhar branch operated, with Thomas taking him up the line to show Percy all of the sides. A huge stone order from Anofa Crory had to go out that day, so Thomas and Percy alternated taking the stone trains to Ellsbridge to be transferred to Henry's train, as Henry could not come up the line due to the loading gate, I think, on some of the banks. On the final train, Thomas would be stopped and almost arrested by a policeman under the rules that an engine must have side plates on an unfenced piece of the line, on a branch line. These regulations had been out of date for a few years, but that didn't stop lectures for all the engines for the LMS and the LNER, getting the entire rulebook read to them by a person who's been described as having the charisma of a wet carrot. A few weeks later, Edward and Duke would have a discussion about Amelia Earhart, the famous woman aviator, while Edward got his train loaded with Slade and other stuff at Arlesborough. Stuart's train, Stuart's train was delayed, however, but Edward had to leave without him to keep to the timetable of the ship at the Knapford Harbour to keep a contract. Knapford, who had been shunting at Arlesborough, decided to take the opportunity and take Stuart's load, effectively earning the contract for the LMS and not the LNER. Percy had been sent to collect the train from Knapford, stopping at him under Article 219 of the Fair Transport Act. A policeman was nearby and raised the alarm, stopping Adam and causing a whole debacle about Adam stole the train in the first place or was simply doing the LNER a favour. Percy was then given the train, delivering to the Knapford Harbour so the ship could, could set sail. We are still in 1934 with the construction of the Ellsbridge Harbour under the Sodal Construction Scheme aim at getting jobs for people during the Great Depression. At the Yard of Carlton, the turntable jammed, causing James to be delayed with a train for the Ellsbridge Harbour. When he was finally allowed to get his train, he set off as fast as he could, tearing down the line as fast as he could. You know, I, I think I just repeated myself, but you'll say. One of the axle boxes on one of the tra trucks began to overheat and spark, causing a fire to be started next to Henry's tunnel. Causing a fire that damaged the power grid and the field next to the line, causing the LNER to cover the cost of the repairs. Wellsworth Yard would be upgraded under the Soto Construction Scheme as well. When Diesel and Colin delivered a train to the yard, a stray spark from Colin caused some of the trucks of coal to catch a light. The fire soon spread to other trucks in the yard. A workman had been left behind from the evacuation, so Thomas bravely decided to go in and rescue for him. Unfortunately for him, his safety valve burst, grinding him to a standstill. Fortunately for him, Colin would be able to save Thomas, allowing both of them to escape the yard so Mickey could extinguish the fire. I'm going to place an event involving Alfred and Geoffrey here in 1935 to give some variety. Alfred was scheduled to take a very important train for the Duke and Duchess of Boxford, but due to an inconvenient placement of a faulty truck, Alfred was stuck in a shed. Spencer was nearby, however, and was put onto the train, being purchased by the Duke and Duchess as their own private engine. Needless to say, this event caused animosity between Alfred and Geoffrey, as it had been found that Geoffrey had been the one who had placed the faulty truck in the first place. In the autumn of 1936, the LNR's Express would suffer a few incidents with Gordon and James. Gordon would break down on the Preston Incline, and James's train would suffer a leaky brake pipe, having to be fixed with bootlaces and newspaper. The Preston Incline was renamed to Gordon's Hill, as he had the honour of being the first engine to break down on it. There's a minor discrepancy with the timeline here, as Victor Tanzig has stated that Eric and Peter were purchased for in 1935 for the LNER, but seeing as your introductory stories take place in 1936, I'm going to put a 1935 here, but say 1936 just to make the timeline make a bit more sense. Following the events of the LNER Express, passenger traffic was at an all-time low, but goods traffic continued to climb. Henry was a valuable asset for the LNER, as he could pull trains that the LMS had to double or triple head. He was the strongest engine on the island until Peter arrived in 1936 for the LMS. Peter was stronger than Henry, turning the goods traffic, good, the goods contracts one by one to the LMS from the LNER. One day, Edward accidentally took on bad water, struggling to pull his trains. He just about gave up at Wellsworth when Peter arrived in the yard. Peter offered to pull Edward up the hill behind his train, doing so with incredible ease. A reporter for the local paper was on Edward's train, publishing an article about the incident. 
The wording of the article caused more contracts to turn back to the LNER, resulting in Eric having to be purchased for the LNER. Eric's design allowed him to pull trains just as long as Henry turning the tide back to the LNER. We are still in 1936 with Eric being a valuable member of the LNER. However, he did have a habit of forgetting trains or taking the wrong trains entirely. The Ellsworth Harbor was, co was completed around this time, intending to be expanded further. Eric was put in charge of this project. One day, Eric would deliver a long train to Ellsbridge. He decided to help Edward with shunting in the yard, as he was a bit early. Unfortunately, he left the stone train on the main line. Eric realized his mistake too late, just barely pulling the train off the main line as Henry passed through. Henry had braked very heavily, causing his wheels to become grounded, resulting in Henry being unable to move. Edward was put onto the Ellsbridge Harbour project for, because of this, and Eric was put on a permanent warning. One small minor mess up and he would have been sent away. At Brendan, a shipment of China clay was being fulfilled, however one day Diesel accidentally pushed the whole train into the ocean, washing away all the valuable China clay. With the wedding of Mrs. Kindly's daughter in September 1936 fast approaching, the Reverend Wilbur Audrey arrived on Soto for the first time to officiate the wedding. We have now reached 1937, with an influx of Spanish refugees following the Spanish Civil War, an uprising intending to throw the, overthrow the government. A ship full of refugees arrived at Brendam Harbour, causing a bit of disarray as no one could understand the Spanish. But because that Toby was able to speak Spanish from his time talking with Henrietta back on the Howard tramway, he was able to translate and help the immigrants. They were soon able to seal across Sodor, becoming integrated into General Sudrick's society. One day on Thomas's train, one of the pregnant immigrants went into labour. Needless to say, Thomas took off fast, intending to reach Ellsbridge where an ambulance would take the passenger off to hospital. Thomas had been rushing so, hard, so fast that he burst his safety valve. Luckily for all parties involved, Eric was nearby and was able to pull the broken down Thomas to Ellsbridge. Station Master Jeffries had sent away the ambulance before they arrived however due to technicalities, causing the baby to be born at Ellsbridge Station. Being named Thomas Eric Galindis in, or in honour of the two engines who had helped with the situation. Thomas Galindis would eventually rise through the ranks of the railway, eventually becoming Edward's driver. After Eric's performance with helping Thomas, Mr. Starr took Eric off permanent warning and put him in charge of the Natford Harbour expansion project. At the Tory Rick mines, Thomas accidentally fell into a mine shaft after the danger board had been moved by some practical joker or hoodlum. It's not really said. One day, Lily was taking a train of scrap to Barrow when one of the trucks hadn't been tied down properly. The pipes fell out of the truck, striking the, the corners of the bridge at, at Crovin's Gate, and because of the broken down bus above, the bridge began to sag. Unfortunately, Reginald was expected to come under the bridge at any moment, so quick thinking from Scar Lowy, Gordon and Lily were able to put their trucks under the bridge and support it as Reginald passed through. A new bridge was put in place, the contract going to the LNER for obvious reasons. The winter of 1937 was very strong, with lots of ice and snow being on Sodor. Donald and Douglas, who were from Scotland, excelled at clearing the snowdrifts, especially as the drifts in Sodor could be 30 feet deep, 10 metres deep for the Brits. One late night, Edward tells the story of Arthur to the engines, Thomas believing that Arthur's ghost does exist due to the various reported sightings over the year. Kate would be purchased for the coal mines at Marston Heights, as the previous arrangement had been a free-for-all for the other engines, being very inefficient. Over the coming days, the engines begin to report the sightings of Arthur's ghost, strangely an E2 engine as opposed to the 2MT that Arthur was, but let's not worry about that right now. Tragically one night, Arthur's ghost arrived at Marion Station. One unfortunate lady looked into one of the coaches, going insane from the sight she saw. Mrs. Zorro was brought in to deal with the ghost, as the theory was that Arthur had always listened to Mr. Zorro, so with his help, Arthur's ghost disappeared for good. At least so it was thought. We now reach the year of 1938, a major year for Sodor. All the snow had melted, which had caused business to increase rapidly, causing the engines to be rushed off their wheels. Alfred was momentarily loaned as the express engine so Gordon could help with the goods work. Alfred here in Victor Tanzig's series is very different to T1E2H3's Alfred. Back to the timeline, Gordon and Henry encounter a cow on the bridge just outside of Crosby. This wouldn't be the only incident involving cows, however. One day, Edward was pulling a goods train when some cows broke through a fence and onto the line, damaging couplings between some of the trucks. On Gordon's hill, the trucks finally broke away, sailing down the hill and crashing into Adam. 
A few weeks later, Thumper the Bull escaped his field, wandering down the loop line. Diesel went to stop the bull, only to be scared away himself. Now, unfortunately for Diesel, Toby saw the whole incident, reporting on his misfortunes to the rest of the L&ER fleet. An outbreak of foot and mouth disease in the cattle on Sodor caused them quite a number of cattle trains to need to be quarantined, being guarded by a customs officer waving a red flag. Joe would be brought to Sodor again to randomly spot check the trains. During this time, Burke and Blair were on Sodor, monitoring the engines and suggesting edits and improvements that Mr. Starr could make to the railway. The pair proposed to sell Toby as he was getting very old. Toby's boiler was also very old at this point, acting up quite a lot. Percy went to go and collect a cattle train for Farmer McCall's farm, stopping when he saw a red, a red flag waving man. Rather oddly, however, Mungo McCall, as he was a f as he was basically known, walked up to the man, handed him something, and then the red the red flag waving man walked away. Percy was suspicious of this, telling some of the engines at the yard. Diesel took the opportunity and went for it, and the ensuing commotion, Toby's boiler kicked it, spewing black smoke everywhere. Against Burke and Blair's orders, Mr. Starr ordered a full reboot of, rebuild of Toby's boiler. Joey found out about McCole's bribery, arresting him. Diesel was also momentarily detained during this time. On the Mid-Soto Railway, Andreas was taking a passenger train to, passenger train to the top station when Burke put out his cigarette in one of the coaches, causing great pain to the coach in question. Andreas reached him because of what he did to the coach. Burke was having an affair during this time on Sodor, which was found out due to some trucks leaking the story. Needless to say, Burke would lose his job, his wife and many other things following this incident, but this would not be the last time we see of Burke or Blair. Douglas was having some troubles with a rather spiteful brake van named Dominic, who was causing great trouble for either Donald or Douglas. Donald would get seven days incarceration at Brendam Docks after bumping Dominic one day. One day, when Douglas was helping James up Gordon Till, he pushed too hard and Dominic was destroyed, killing him. But like Burke and Blair, this wouldn't be the last time we would see Dominic. Scott, also known as the Flying Scotsman, would come to Sodor to help out with odd jobs on the LNER. Jeffrey would also come to Sodor on this time to help with work for the LMS, creating yet another rivalry between the LNER and LMS. Jeffrey would of course bring trouble to Sodor, with a spate of axle hotboxes befalling the LNER trains, causing delays for them. Joe would connect the incidents and realise that the LMS was behind these incidents, but not knowing specifically who was doing it, so he launched a sting operation. By using Colleen and Diesel, he would effectively arrest Jeffrey. Colleen would fall to a simple ruse, which would then lead to her giving up Diesel for what he did back in 1934 to Percy, as it would lead to the... Yeah. Jeffrey would be shunted for 30 days following the sting operation, being reassigned to other parts of the LMS for a good long while, but this would not be the last word see of the Red Engine. Stanley was purchased in 1938 to help out with the expanding goods services on the MSR, but a few incidents did happen while he was on there. First, Stuart derailed on the points at Lower Arsberg, and then the cranes designed to pull Hill Stuart back onto the line both failed. Stanley was then tasked with helping Stuart back onto the line, doing, doing so with incredible ease due to Stanley's design being American. Later that day, Falcon and Stanley took the train up to the top of the line, with Falcon coming off the line just up near the mountain road, but with Stanley's help, Falcon was able to be re-railed. A few days later, Stuart was up at the slate quarry when the slate trucks ran away on the incline, crashing into him and damaging his funnel. Falcon had a fear that all of these incidents were somehow tied in with Stuart blowing his whistle, so one day they decided to test this theory. After getting Stuart to blow his whistle in the presence of Stanley, a box arrived, but it was not Stuart's funnel, it was in fact a pipe. It appeared that Stanley was indeed jinxed, but there was something that could help the MSR crew. That of course was the lucky lamp, being transferred from the Scarlowy Railway to the MSR. Toby would tell the story on how the lamp had first been found following the sabotage attempt at Napford Harbour in 1917. And with that, Season 1 is complete, spanning 1934 to mid-1938, but hoo boy, it's going to get a lot more richer in content as we go along. I'd give this first season a solid 7.5 out of 10, a great start for a Thomas YouTuber back in 2017. Continuing on to Season 2, we are still in 1938, with the arrival of Mont Montgomery to Sodor, otherwise known as City of Truro. Gordon was not pleased, as he was annoyed with the fact that Montgomery had supposedly gone 100 miles per hour in 1904, 
which had been unverified at the time. Gordon's brother Scott, however, of course, achieved 100 miles per hour in 1931, so that was where the argument was coming from. A remark about Montgomery not having a dome was mentioned by Gordon. Coincidentally, the next day, a loose brick from, a, from the bridge struck Gordon on his dome, so when he got to the viaduct, a teasing wind would scoop D Gordon's dome right off and into the river below, disappearing under the mud and rocks. While Gordon was in the works, Alice was brought to Soto to be a temporary express engine. A surprise inspection by a member of the railway board was undertaken on Soto, inspection being thought to be an expect that's about like which railway would get the boot from Sodor, the LNER or the LMS. The inspector is a name that you all definitely know, that man was Sir Topham Hatt. During the inspection, Sir Topham Hatt ended up at the MSR, encountering Stanley who he had served with in France during World War I. While Sir Topham Hatt was at Islesborough, Adam accidentally lost control of a fully loaded tar wagon which careened out of the yard and into James, derailing the engine and covering him in tar. A few days later, while Percy was trying to play a trick on the new branch lines, branch line coaches, who were incredibly snooty, he ran into a luggage trolley, spilling jam everywhere, and ending up with Sir Topham Hatt's trousers atop his funnel. Sir Topham Hatt was not impressed at all. He was going to have to make his decision about who would get the boot from the island when a very serious incident changed all of that. Wendell came to Sodor, stealing trainloads of goods to then take to a group of lorries who had William hostage over unpaid debts with Wendell. I don't know how that all kind of happened, but anyway. With the help of Wyth, Lily, and Thomas, Wendell was able to stop the free lorries, allowing Joey and the police to arrest the lorries. But due to the fact that Wendell had been stealing in the first place, no matter the fact that Wendell was being blackmailed, Wendell was sent to Railgate for 15 days. This whole affair showed to Sir Topham Hatt that the ends of Soto could work together, so he allowed both railways to stay on Soto indefinitely. The boulder atop the hill just outside of Crosby was a tourist site, with people flocking to the site to marvel at the strange circular boulder, very unlike most other boulders in shape. One week in 1938, the rain came down hard. So much rain came down, in fact, that the boulder began to move. One day, it rolled onto the main line, almost squashing Diesel and Colin, who were passing by the area. Needless to say, the boulder blocked the main line, which caused many delays. Following an attempt to clear the boulder using Henry and Gordon, Billy Schumach from the Franklin Sun Munition Factory was brought in for assistance. Billy was a specialist of dynamite, so decided to blow up the boulder, with obvious results. The main line was destroyed, but luckily it was able to be rebuilt, after a few days or weeks of course. At Napford Harbour during September of 1938, the dog workers went on strike, causing a great deal of chaos for the LNER crew. Due to Napford Harbour being closed, all ships were being directed, redirected to Brentham, causing many trains, well, causing so many trains in such a little area that some of the LNER crew had to go and help the LMS. This arrangement was satisfactory for a week or so until tensions began to rise once again. One night, while Duck was on Soda, he decided to help Henry up Gordon's Hill not knowing that the brake van was very old. When the train began to climb, all of Duck's weight transferred onto the brake van, destroying it. Little did anyone know that the brake van's destruction would wake a certain entity. The teenagers at Brendan all boiled to the point that Henry, Gordon and James went on strike, protesting the conditions that they were working in, with abuse from the LMS crew being given to them constantly. Mr. Starr would then be able to convince Gordon, Henry and James to go back to Brendan, apologising for comments he had said the previous day relating to potential scrappings. A few incidents involving goods trains would, would take place in November 1938 very seriously. The first of which involved Lily's train breaking in half and the brake van disappearing suddenly, accompanied by a weird howling noise. The brake van and the guard, Richard Payton, were found in the vicarage orchard, the brake van destroyed and Richard a charred skeleton. Clearly something supernatural had occurred for had been able to perform an act like this. A few days after the funeral for Richard, another accident would occur, this one being a bit more serious. James's train split just in half on Wellsworth Junction with an unlucky Peter coming down Gordon's Hill at the same time, who being unable to stop in time, ploughed straight into James's train causing enough damage to send Peter off to the works for a good long while. As it turned out, it was Dominic who had been causing all this chaos, having been summoned due to Duck's accident on the hill. Dominic was out for revenge, plain and simple. One night, a group of engines set out to find Dominic and put an end to the madness. 
Douglas stood up to Dominic, impressing Lily to the point of falling in love with Douglas, but they'll come a bit into play a little down the line. Dominic was scared away, however, his spirit disappearing for good, or so the engines fought. In December of 1938, due to Peter having to be in the works for the next six months due to the injuries that he sustained, Geoffrey was brought back to Soto to help with the LMS goods work. Geoffrey had been in Railgate and become a reformed engine. He went to all the engines that he had wronged and apologising to all of them. Geoffrey's return would be met with apprehension at first, as shortly after he arrived back on Sodor, a span of sabotages occurred. Firstly, Thomas was sent onto the wrong line, and since the rails had been covered with oil from a nearby barrel, Thomas would go straight into the water up near Farquhar. The barrel had come from King Ori's Bridge, so a delegation of police officers went up the line to investigate. A sabotage on the MSR was achieved by the sabotaging of the points just before Reneas came through with his passenger train. Lucky for the MSR, there were no serious injuries, injuries from this incident, but that couldn't be said for the next accident on Sodor. Late one day in mid-December 1938, two young boys, twin brothers Robert and Sean Creedy, would watch a train hauled by Donald pass by on their way back from school. Their father, Michael Creedy, was the guard on board the train, a roster now to end up impacting Sodor in unforeseen ways. Early the next morning, the flying capital was cruising down the line, heading from, Map from Napford to Manchester. Just outside of Kildane, however, the snow forced the signal down, causing Henry to crash into the, into the back half of Donald's train, killing the guard Michael Creedy. His two sons would be taken in by their uncle, Gregory Hall, as their mother had, been, had killed herself due to the death of her husband, Mrs. Zorro being, able to un being unable to help with the family, and the house being foreclosed soon after. Gregory Hall would abuse both the boys, causing one of them to resent the railways that had killed his father, leading to a few major incidents, but I will discuss that a lot later. The media outcry from the sabotage apparently being a murder, the mistress who, had, who was holding the saboteur gave him up, a Jacob Berg, as in Burke and Blair, the railway and board investigators who were on Sodor back earlier in 1938. Which, now that we've come to the end of it, wow, it's been nearly six pages of script and I think I've been talking for about 20 minutes just on 1938 itself. It really was a dense and packed year for Sodor, huh? We are now officially into 19, 1939, finally. Still another dense year for Sodor, but less dense than the previous year. Due to Henry's accident involving the Flying Kipper, he was sent away to be repaired, and Winston from the former Furness Railway was brought in to help with the goods work. A guard on Sodor, a man named Hober, ran into a heaping lot of debt, so he was easily convinced to smuggle drugs on the Sodor via a goods train. Homer would be arrested and revealed that the drugs were on Gordon's train. Gordon was taken in for questioning and momentarily arrested for a few hours while the investigations took place. Later that night, Gordon back got back to the sheds just in time to hear Edward tell the others about how the Furness Railway closed down in 1907. On the Scarlowie Railway, the British Union of Fascists, or I shall call them the British Union for simplicity, had an incident with one of the station masters. One of the workers used a derogatory term for David Becker, a Jewish man, the station master at Sudwin. The worker was fired, so later that night, four men from the British Union attempted to beat up David, only to find out really quickly that he was a boxing champion back in his old school days, I think in roughly 1920. David was welcomed as a hero the next day on the Scarlowie Railway. The attacks were frontline press, with the attackers denying that they were affiliated with the British Union, but the press did not believe so. The public outcry grew so severe that the British Union would leave Sodor, dissolving in 1940 for various reasons. You know, with the war. Due to the incident with the boulder back in 1938, Franks and Sons munitions had to lay off a huge number of the staff, eventually downsizing and moving the operation to Krosnai Kern on the Scarlowie Railway. The SKR fleet undertook this operation with the usual complaints from Duncan. The relocation would be completed in March 1939. A few days later, Reneas was taking a passenger train down the Scarlowie Railway when his valve gear jammed. Due to the rain, one of the trees above Reneas began to slip, and so Reneas, in great pain, was able to back up and narrowly avoid getting squashed by and saving his passengers. A few days later, Percy would take Thomas's train with him, taking the Vicar's Sunday School to the beach and back. However, on the way back, a sudden storm rolled in, rushing away some of the tracks just outside of Marston Heights. Percy was unable to stop in time, sliding into the very deep body of water. Diesel was nearby and teased Percy a lot about the incident, calling him a frog and the such. 
One day, the station master, Willie Hansen, and the owner of the Sodal Bus c Company, David Hansen, made a bet on, how on who could get to Farquhar first, Thomas or Bertie. The race started right there, needless to say, and the race caused most of the passengers to miss their stops, and Thomas and Bertie were soon caught for speeding. Eric had allowed Thomas to pass him at Ellsbridge on a red signal, violating the laws about signalling and blocks. A few days after the race, Mickey would find out about this. Joey would then arrest the pair, would arrest Thomas and, and Bertie, giving them 10 days each in Railgate. Eric would get two days incarceration. Thomas and Bertie wouldn't, wouldn't be alone at Railgate, however, as Kate pulled a trick on Diesel, causing Diesel to derail at Marston Heights coal plant. Kate would receive six days at Railgate. With rising tensions in Europe, Soda was called to defend itself with two trains loaded with munitions and anti-aircraft guns arriving on Sodor. The first being the first for the LNR being pulled by Molly, intending to defend the west and northwest of Sodor. The second train was pulled by Peter, intending to defend the south and the east of Sodor. Eric and James were all struck by the train of armaments pulled by Molly for different reasons. A new joint army naval base would be built on Sodor near Vickerstown, the contract being shared by both the LNER and LMS. There was one minor incident when Diesel accidentally derailed a railgun, with James witnessing this. James would then tell the Enders about what happened to him and Amanda on the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway in 1917. Fort Sudrian would be opened on the 4th of July 1939, becoming a central point for docks and ships related to the army and navy. The 51st Vickerstown Regiment would also be based here, trading regularly. Since Peter had returned to Sodor, Geoffrey was sent back to the mainland. Winston was due for his five year service, so Molly stayed on Sodor for the LNER to help with the goods work. One day, Gordon's whistle burst, letting out a very shrill whistling noise that wouldn't be shut off for a long while. It was only with the intervention of workmen, a ladder, and a hammer that the noise was finally gone. Eric and Molly's relationship began to blossom, with Diesel and Adam mocking Eric. One day, Molly tricked Adam and Diesel to take an empty train from Wellsworth to Barrow, allowing the opportunity for the LNER to swoop in and, la and nab two lucrative contracts earning more money for the LNER. Lily had to explain to Gordon one day about how Douglas and her were a couple, were having Gordon and Lily as a couple. Gordon had been outraged at first, but then he heard the reasoning and mellowed out, apologising to Douglas the next day. On that same day, Henry arrived back to Sodor. Due to Henry's return, however, Molly and Winston were sent back to the mainland. Every year during the last week of August, Godred's Day, in celebration of King Godred MacHarold of Sodor, a weeks-long celebration is held to commemorate this special occasion. On the final day, a special engine parade is held, the specific date I'll refrain from saying for a brief bit. Fort Sudjung had acquired a new engine called Benson, who was with the ROD. Benson was a very bossy busybody, taking his authority as a military officer very seriously. The day before Godred's Day and the parade were due to take place, Kate hit a tree on the line and derailed on the main line, damaging some of the rails and sleepers. It was a tight race the next day to fix the track and type for the parade, but luckily it was able to go ahead. The parade went very successfully, with the night festivities culminating on fireworks this way. The LNER and LMS put aside their differences and enjoyed themselves, a good thing as well, as the date of Godred's Day was August 31st. And considering we are in 1939, the next day would change the course of history forever. Alright, wow, that season was very packed, covering 1938 to 1939. Victor has definitely gotten into his stride at this point, with pacing and narration issues of the past being non-existent here. Honestly, a very great season, 9 out of 10. For the next part of this video, it does get extremely depressing, you have been warned. On September 1st, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland with the assistance of the USSR and Stalin. On September 3rd, 1939, the UK and France declared war on Germany, Italy and the USSR. The Second World War was about to begin and not all the engines would survive. We have now reached the stories of war. The big four railway companies were, uni were unified into one big railway collective, the sole purpose being to supply munitions and raw materials to the front line to fight Hitler and his army. Hitler had invaded Eastern Europe and turned his sights to Western Europe. On the day that France fell to Nazi Germany, Operation Chariot was put into effect in 1940, detailing the mass evacuation of civilians, mainly children, from the ports and big cities to places in the countryside deemed the least likely to be hit with German bomber attacks. 
Gordon, Reginald, James, and Donald had had previously volunteered for the role of evacuations if this if Operation Chariot was ever put to effect. So in June 1940, the operation was implemented. After a few weeks of non-stop trains, one incident would affect the engines deeply. Alice had burst her safety valve just outside of Highbridge, and due to the size of the train, Gordon was the only one capable of pulling it. Not long after he left, however, the Germans launched a lightning plane attack on Highbridge. Gordon saw a tunnel coming, coming and dashed inside of it. However, the back of half of his train had become uncoupled, being exploded by a German bomb outside the tunnel. 157 people died on the attack on Highbridge, 84 of whom had been on Gordon's train. On the mainland in 1941, at the town of Lofel, the, the, the Luftwaffe attacked, exploding the engine shed. The fire was getting close to a fully loaded oil train nearby, so with extreme bravery from Alberto's crew, they got the train out of there. A good thing too, as the yard office had nearby had been filled with civilians hiding from the Luftwaffe. 30 people died in the attack on Lofel that day, but it could have been much, much worse if Albert hadn't got the oil train out of the way. Soda wouldn't escape the wrath of the Nazis, however, as one night the Luftwaffe attacked many places across Sodor. Henry hid in the tunnel between Knapford and Lower Knapford, giving it the name we know it as today. At Knapford Station, a fully loaded train of munitions was just outside of the tunnel. Colin heroically grabbed the train and ran from the station, sacrificing himself to save Diesel, Toby, Thomas, and the town of Knapford. More than 100 people died in the attack, but it could have easily have been triple if the munitions train had exploded. Rest in peace, Colin. 1885 to 1941. Age 56. Reginald, Gordon, Donald, and James were recalled back to Sodor to help with the repairs. At the end of 1941, the USA would be called into the, to, into the war because of Pearl Harbor. Due to the help of the Americans, they began to ship engines to the UK to help with the war effort, one of those being Rosie, who worked at Fort Sudrian. Benson would be reassigned to Brendam Docks. In 1942, the military campaign in North Africa was heating up, so much so that so many Indians had, were asked to go and fight the war. Thomas, Edward, Henry, Gordon, Adam, Lily, Peter, and Douglas all volunteered to fight. The group were given inbuilt radios, taught the ancient Sudruk language to disguise radio communications, and were inducted into the 110th platoon of the, platoon of the Steam Corps, otherwise known as the Wild Norwesters. Edward was given charge of the Wild Norwesters. While in North Africa, the Wild Norwesters were attacked by many German engines, but ended with faces designed to intimidate the enemy for some weird reason. The Wild Norwesters were able to repel the German engines time after time, making use of the railguns that had brought them with them to Africa, notably one of them being Big Bertha. In 1943, espionage and sabotage were found aplenty on the front line. Peter was almost killed when the bridge he was expected to cross was blown up. The lucky lamp, which had somehow made its way to Africa with the Wild Norwesters, had split Peter's train, causing him to stop before he got to the bridge, saving his life. Of course, with the lucky lamp away from the MSR, they suffered a few incidents. The British Union was still operating, albeit in a far smaller capacity, but that wouldn't stop them from implementing their own espionage tactics. One of the men, Gus, would cause a great deal of damage on Sodor. Back on Sodor, Alfred and Jeffrey had been called in to fill the vacant spaces left by the engines of the Wild Norwesters. The pair hated each other over the events that took place back in 1935 in London. Ellsbridge's station master, Alexander Jeffries, would be, would be poisoned by Bobby, an association of the British Union, who died while in an argument with Toby. With Jeffries out of the way, a greater plan was made to target Sodor once again. Gus and Bobby would place a, place a bomb into a train that was due for Napford Harbour, with enough explosives to destroy a sizable portion of the docks. A workman decided to check the trains randomly, however, discovering the bomb. Alfred was nearby, pushing the train and charging as far out of Napford as he could. Unfortunately, James was passing the other way, with Mrs. Starr riding in the brake van. The train passed James, but, as the bo but the bomb went right off in front of Alfred and next to the brake van. Alfred, the guard, and Mr. Starr were killed by the explosion. Mr. Zorro would be put in charge of Soto's railways because of this. Rest in peace, Alfred, 1911-1943, to age 32. Rest in peace, Jonathan Starr, 1887-1943, age 56. The British Union would be expanded once and for all with the arrest of Bobby and Gus, 
as they gave up the whereabouts of the British Union, and when it was found that it had been bankrolled by the German SS, most of its members were sentenced to execution or life in prison on the spot. The Wild Norwesters had succeeded in Africa, and were sent to the front lines in Germany in 1944, moving ever so closer to Berlin. One day in 1945, Thomas and Douglas were taking a train to Hellenbergen, when a sudden attack by the Germans caused them to be stuck behind enemy lines. While behind enemy lines, Thomas and Douglas came across Oliver, Toad, and Blair, as in Burke and Blair, at an abandoned factory. Toad had been converted into a radio tapper trying to locate the whereabouts of Joseph Mengele, one of the most disgusting people ever imaginable who, exper who experimented on people in concentration camps. Heldenbergen was taken back by the Wild in the West as allowing for Thomas, Douglas, Oliver, Toad, and Blair to escape back to the Allied forces. While the town was being cleared up the next day, an unexploded round of ammunition was discovered. Henry tried to escape, but a safety valve went off. Lily then sacrificed herself to save Henry, killing herself in the process. Rest in peace, Lily, 1883 to 1945, age 62. A few days after Lily's death, Peter was taking a train to another town when the hospital of the said town was being ca held captive by the Nazis, with civilians being trapped in the basement. Peter, however, saw the fact that the hospital was key to the Allied offensive, and the fact that the, the Nazis outweighed the civilians by two to one, Peter fired a shell that would change his life. Word of Joseph Mengele's whereabouts stated that he might be at the Bolbrick concentration camp, so the Wild Norwesters liberated the camp. But however, Mengele escaped. Anna went to go check in one of the sheds, finding sites that I really don't want to describe. Edward would also look in the same shed. Following the traumatic experiences they experienced, the Wild Norwesters were transferred to Ostend in Belgium. While in Ostend, an a mistake allowed a coach full of German POWs to enter, to enter the yard. Adam offered to shunt it on back onto a train going back into Germany, but instead he shunted it into the sea, drowning all the men inside the coach. Due to this incident, the 110th platoon of the Steam Corps was disbanded and the engines were sent back to Sodor. The Second World War would end on May 8, 1945 in Europe, and on September 2nd, 1945 in the Pacific. Wow, that, that again was very de dense and very depressing. Losing Colin, Alfred, Mr. Starr, and Lily, this is due to make a few changes for the series as we go on. Stories of War is probably the best content Victor Tansic will produce for a good while. I would give it a solid 9.5 out of 10. It's pretty, pretty good. We're now on to Season 3, with a broader sense of years, but no less impactful to the overall plot of the series. The Reverend Wilbur Audrey would publish the first book of the Railway series, ad somewhat adapting real events in 1945, but some of them weren't were entirely fictional. Six months after the Wild and the Westers returned home, Edward was seeing Mickey about the nightmares that he was having after looking into the shed at Bolbrook. Adam had no remorse for his actions, and so was refusing to have them therapy sessions with Mickey. Since the war had led so many people homeless, a wave of immigrants across the UK happened, finding jobs and starting lives again. Radek Zelenka was one of these immigrants, originating from Czechoslovakia. He worked on the MSR, establishing himself as a very hard worker. We have now reached 1946, where structural reforms to rebuild British railways were undertaken, the results of which would be finalised before 1948, aiming to nationalise the railways and coal mines of the UK. In May 1946, Adnan would be confronted by Radek over the drowning of the German POWs, one of them had been his brother. Adam was heartbroken with this news, only finding solace when he found out that Radek's brother did deserve to die as he had swindled many Czechs and Jewish people out of their fortune. During the war for his own personal gain, at the sheds that night, the LMS engines were informed that with the absence of Colin and Lily, replacements would be brought in to, to help in the increasing workload. In June 1946, the two new engines arrived for the newly established joint railway with the LMS and LNER, the old nicknames and companies being reunified into te one temporary one. Pickett and Samantha were brought to the Sodor. Some fuel tankers had had their maintenance delayed for some time, and one day, when Henry was pulling the train, one of the brake bolts locked on, causing a spark and starting a fire under one of the tankers. Gordon was due to pass through at any moment, so with quick thinking from Pickett, who had been passing with some fuel ta with some milk tankers, Pickett had been able to extinguish the fire with the milk. Mr. Zara would suffer from a very nasty cough, usually disappearing for a few days at a time with sickness. It was only after a doctor's visit that he was diagnosed with lung cancer, requiring chemotherapy treatment. 
In his place, Basil Corbett was appointed temporary manager of Soto Railways. The Indians were not happy with the news of Basil Corbett's of being temporary controller, however, as he was a notorious penny pinch, being the one who had proposed Toby to be sold to Burke and Blair for scrap during the, the Piers visit in 1938. The race for head controller of Soto's Railways would heat up as Giles Freeman would put his head into the ring. Leaks about contracts and such had become public quite, a, quite frequently, causing Soto Railways to lose some contracts to the ever-increasing road competition. The engine suspected Giles, but nothing could be proven. One day, James would crash into the rear half of Henry's train just outside of Marin, due to the forgetfulness of Marin's signalman. The fallout from the incident caused Basil to cut passenger trains as well as other services to stay afloat, losing more contracts to the roads. A few days later, James would still be in the works, with the money for the repairs being very much delayed by Basil. A trick played on Samantha by Diesel about, about backing signals caused Samantha to derail at Lower Suttery. The public image of Sodor's Railways deteriorated even, even further. The head control of Sodor's Railways was still yet to be decided, being a very unlikely candidate. You may have heard of him, he was too top of hat. I'm gonna partially cheat here as the next episode in the timeline like in canon controller is my personal least favorite it's just kind of mid. All you need to know about what happened is that Sir Topham Hatt left as the director of the railway board following a disagreement over policies with some of the members of the board. Seeing as he had already been depicted as the fat director in the railway series he decided to take the opportunity to become controller for Sodor's railways. Due to politics in London, the Sodor council was created in 1946. The capital city of Sodor was decided to be Vickerstown as that was the main entry point to Sodor. So Topham Hatt would receive funding from the Sodor Council to build the Vickerstown Sheds and the Vickerstown Station, this being completed in roughly April 1947. Once the project was done, a reshuffle was instituted. This reshuffle basically meant that the engines built for certain tasks, i.e. express, heavy, heavy goods, mixed goods, etc would be permanently assigned to those rows, as in the past it was sort of a whichever engine was available had to do the job, leading to general chaos and underperforming. However, the structure had some teething troubles, as priority for fuel trains caused other trains to be delayed, causing a flow-on effect. The railway series was gaining massive popularity in this time, however some events happened on Sodal because of these books. Henry would tell Samantha about the real story of, Na of Henry's tunnel, about how he hid in the tunnel to avoid the whir of the Nazi planes. Due to the influx of tourists to Sodal, following the success of the railway series, the Sodal Council began to earn a lot more revenue, investing it back into the Ellsbridge Airport, which will be discussed properly later in the video. Adam and Percy would get into an argument, leading to Percy actually coming off the rails at a set of faulty points, see, because he was distracted. The general sentiment was that the LNER had seemed to be painted in a good light, being the, always the ones that came on top with no representation of the LMS at all. The Indians were getting annoyed at the books at the fact that they were being so fictionalized that Wilbert Audrey had to come back to Sodor to appease the Indians, explaining that these books were just that, fiction. The, the books were designed to be for children, with some character arcs and events being made up to appeal to younger readers as some of the real truths were a bit depressing for some of them. A side note, there is a reference to the fact that the events of a closed shave is 100% accurate in the books. This, of course, was changed later down the line to be around the events involving Edwin and Brian in 1915, so the reference to a close shave as is, is, is fact isn't fully correct, but I digress. Back on the mainland, Wolf was becoming more and more expensive to maintain, eventually being given the free options offered to an engine at the end of its time. Heritage Line, being sold to another railway, or Death by Blackwater, a chemical compound able to permanently put an engine to sleep. Wyff chose a fourth option, due to the fact that he was in fact a governmentally owned military engine. Wyff came back to Sodal to say his final goodbyes, fortunately being able to save Rosie who was teetering on the edge after she derailed just outside of Crosby. Wyff was able to hold Rosie back until, like in place, until Mickey was able to arrive. It was revealed by Wyff that he had signed up for target practice, as since he had been owned by the military he decided to give, be of one last use for king and country. Wiff gave his final goodbyes, being towed out to sea by barge. On the Farquhar branch, they desperately needed another engine to help with the fuel deliveries to Marston Heights. The timing was incredibly close, however, as with a quick phone call and intervention by 10 cents, Wiff was then able to be purchased and saved. 
However, due to a partial communications breakdown, it appeared they Whiff had been killed by a live round, but he surprised the engines roughly 10 hours after he saved. Whiff was permanently assigned to the Far Club branch. December 1947 would be especially busy as the businesses of Sodor rushed to send their stock out before the ports were closed down through the snow. Jeffrey was brought back to Sodor to help with the workload. Due to weird dream visions from Alfred and a weird kind of shared dream in the Beyond realm, Alfred and Jeffrey were able to reconcile their differences, with Alfred mentioning that Colin, Lily and Mr. Starr sent their regards. Henry and Douglas had always had animosity surrounding the death of Lily as she had died to save him. Following a few misplaced words from Ed, from Henry, however, Douglas rammed Henry right off the track. Needless to say, this had reached the boiling point of a several year long feud. So Tom and Hat would instigate an emergency meeting with the pair, getting to them to resolve around the fact that Lily had died a hero and would have sacrificed herself for any of the other engines. Douglas then realised the error of his ways, apologising to Henry, a good thing as well, as just a few weeks later a very major event in railway history would unfold. British Railways would be created, starting business on the 1st of January 1948, combined with the big four railway companies into one unified company. The first part of the transition process was to nationalise the network, standardising parts to be used universally for all of the engines, greatly reducing maintenance costs. There was a few setbacks on the main network, notably of the reallocation of locomotives to regions and to trains that they were woefully underpowered for. So really, British Railways had its pros and cons. I'm going to presume that in 1948, following an incident involving Atlas and some slate trucks, as well as a few choice words from Andreas towards Atlas, Edward told him the story of the events that, hap that happened with Edward and Samson back in 1896. While the story at the time had no effect on Andreas, he would soon grow to accept Andreas as a proper engine, however under very dire circumstances, but that would be discussed a little later in this video. We are still in 1948 as a severe storm rolled over the island. Thomas and Kate were stuck at Marston Heights due to a landslide, and seeing as it didn't have another e exit, the water began to rise. Mickey was quick to the scene, but the, mud of, but the wall of mud and silt was massive. With quick thinking from a workman and Mickey, James and Donald were brought up the line, armed with snowplows. After a charge from the trio, they were able to break through the mud and save Thomas and Kate with grumbles for, from grumbles from James about being covered in mud. Three days later, the rain stopped and the water receded. Marston Heights was damaged by the flood water, but due to it being nationalised, BR paid for the repairs. Unfortunately, the China clay pits at Brendam had would be flooded beyond repair, and due to it being privately owned, it had to close due to the storm. Neil was of course the engine of the China clay pits, so with its closure, Neil was left out of a job. Luckily, he was able to be purchased by the Kildane Scrapyard as a general shunting engine. In 1949, a very serious trial would occur for one of the engines, not Adam, but Peter. The trial was sensational, a world first of its type. The trial was around the events that happened with Peter and the hospital in 1945. Peter originally pleaded not guilty to charges of war crimes, but with constant barrage for the prosecution, Peter had a very angry outburst, saying that the civilians in the hospital deserved to die. Needless to say, this changed the course of the trial, with Peter changing his, status to, changing his plea to guilty. Peter was given a different sentence, different to regular laws for non flasis vehicles, as Peter was given 15 years in Railgate, due to be released in 1964. We have now reached the new decade, with the 1950s. Due to Peter's absence, Jeffrey was brought back to Sodor, permanently becoming another Henry heavy goods engine, much to relieve the relief of the other engines. Due to iron ore deposits being discovered up the mountain of Coley Fell, the Peel Godred Railway would begin construction, purchasing Hurricane and Pug to help with the construction work and eventual running. A viaduct was constructed as well as a mile long tunnel under the walled town of Peel Godred itself. The construction was going well, and after two years it was soft open for revenue earning services. The passenger engine purchased for this line, however, would be a very shocking surprise. That engine was Arthur, being almost one to one the exact engine as the same as the same one who had crashed and died back in 1923, eliciting a very angry response from Edward and Toby when they first met. This new Arthur had served during the war, however, this being the reason why he was still in LMS colours. His design would be the basis for the BR DR standard 2MT. Edward told the Ar would tell Arthur about the tale of the old Arthur and the ghost associated with the story in a partial capacity.
1943, the Peel Gothard line would open for revenue earning services, purchasing Samson to help out with additional heavy goods traffic, as well as the he iron ore deposits being turned into steel for general use across Sodor. The Peel Gothard line would be very prosperous, but that would spell the end for the MSR. A few months after the opening of the Peel Gothard line, a solely tourist focused railway would be constructed in 1953. The yards, sheds, and track to Kirk Mishan would be completed in 1954. It was found that some of the company's executives had been embezzling, so the CFR project was put on hold. The autumn of 1954 would be extremely rough for the MSR, as with the opening of the Peel Godred line, goods and passenger services began to dry up on the MSR. They say bad things come in freeze, which ended up being the case for the MSR, as first, an avalanche happened during the launch of a new passenger service, then a line of trucks would run away on the incline at the Slate Crow, crashing into Atlas and causing a decent bit of damage for the small engine. Andreas would help Atlas with his work while Atlas was being repaired, still showing growth towards the small industrial engine. The funds began to dry up progressively, with the MSR soon running on fumes. There would be one final incident. The road to Peel Godred was being built, and George the Steamroller was brought to help it. One day after a minor bit of boasting from Falcon, George ran into the train. A witness reported the incident to the police, causing the company who owned George to have to play for, pay for the repairs. The money that the company gave to the MSR was used to pay out redundancies to the staff and secure a new home for the six MSR engines. And the railway that they were purchasing and eventually sent to was, of course, the Scarloway Railway. The now 10 strong engine fleet would work happily side by side for a very long time. Wilbur Audrey would be present during the reallocation, drawing up story ideas to use for future books. On the mainland in 1954, near Rossworth Rail, Sheffield worked there. He was known as a speed demon, usually arriving 5-10 to 10 minutes before scheduled. One day he had to take a train that had been delayed, so naturally, he sped. He would, be, he would derail, crashing into a car and killing its sole occupant. Sheffield would get 30 days in Railgate, and when he was let out he, would be, he went permanently slow as so to avoid derailing and killing someone with high speed. In March 1955, Walter Paxman would visit Sodor as part of the BR's gauge on how to modernise the network, intending to use diesel's basis as the main basis for, for shunters across the UK. It was here where it was revealed that diesel had actually been called Bruce to the former LNER engines. Jumping forward to November 1955, when winter was rolling through, a thick blanket of fog would cover Sodor and it being an island it wouldn't go any way away anytime soon, with day fading into night. During this time, Operation Night Fleet was undertaken, determining the viability of using engines to, sne to sneak around in foggy conditions to heighten the enemies considering Europe politics at this time. The engines of Soda would encounter various accounts of hearing this engine, thinking that it was a ghost of some time. After many sightings, the operation was deemed a failure. Edward told the engines on how he had been sworn to secrecy as since he had been a commanding officer during the war, he was allowed to see the classified experiment. The engines had never quite figured out the true reason behind the purpose of Operation Night Fleet, but that was soon forgotten as 1956 was rolling around, a very big year for the history of Sodor. And so, that was in Season 3 from 1946 to 1955. I will say the start of the season was a bit slow, but it quickly picked up, being an entertainable one. The camera work has notably changed, as well as the general pacing and narration work. I'd give this season maybe an 8 out of 10 if asked. 1956 would see BR's modernization plan aimed at strengthening the railways and upgrading them to be to the latest standard. This involved cutting branch line work so it deemed unprofitable, the loop line on Sodor falling into this category. Barrow would gain a new station pilot, a rough engine called Sheffield. He moved incredibly slow for reasons of his own past, causing many trains to be delayed while at Barrow. Geoffrey would be involved in an accident due to faulty signalling leading to Murdoch, a BR standard 9F, to be brought to Sodor to help out with the goods work. He was quick to point out that Sodor was mainly being run by engines from before the Second World War, causing some tension with some of the engines, Henry in particular. Murdoch would overdo himself, however, attempting to take a very long train up Gordon's Hill, even with Reginald as a banker and the train stalled. Henry was brought in to assist. That night in the shed, Murdoch would explain that he was the prototype for the BR standard 9F and wanted to prove himself so he didn't end up on the scrap heap. Henry understood, explaining it to the other engines why Murdoch acted the way he did. After a month or so, Jeffrey would be repaired and Murdoch would be sent back to the mainland, having a long and fulfilling career. In 1956, funding would be supplied for the CFR, 
allowing the construction to continue on the line up the Cobbley Fell Mountain. The rolling stock was to be purchased by the Scarlowe Railway, and four engines were purchased from the Snowdon Mountain Railway in Wales. The engines were Alaric, Wilfred, Harry, and Ernest. Construction would continue up the mountain and towards the early stages of 1957, the, stage, the station of Devil's Bag was reached. A soft opening was held at Devil's Bag as a tour guide group wished to ride on the railway. While at Devil's Bag, one of the guides told the story of King Godred and Coley. The story states that Coley was a tyrant of Sodor back in the 11th century with King Godred killing him. But when a rumour about the Coley's return surfaced, King Godred went to fight him, locked in eternal combat for all eternity. A local tour guide was a local reporter was in the tour guide at the CFR, publishing a glowing review of the experience in mid-1957. The influx of tourists caused because of this caused the Peel Gods line to become heavily inundated, causing the Topham had to purchase a new engine, Cuffbird. Cuffbird was from Australia, designed to take long goods trains lost across the Australian hills and desert. BR was investing in moving money between banks via rail, as trains would carry a lot more than trucks. Needless to say, crooks and whippy robbers would seize this opportunity to attempt to try and rob the trains. Jackson Bailey, Sodal's resident, resident Roth Fogman, was stopped by these attempts, having had word from his grandson Dennis. Jackson was a strong fighter, quickly disposed of the whippy robbers. Cuffbeard was revealed to be the notorious gangster Johnny Cuba, but before the cops could arrest him, he disappeared, having stolen a few trains while on Sodor, much to the annoyance of the Peel Godred line who trusted him. Since Johnny Cuba, as I'll now call him from now on, had escaped, leaving the Peel Godred line without another engine, Molly was brought back to Sodor, allowing her to catch up with Eric. The town of clay pits at Brendan were decided to be re reopened with decent enough money because it was a decent enough money earner back in the day. Bill and Ben were purchased to operate the line as their smaller heights allowed them to enter the smaller tunnels at the pits. The pits reconstruction would take a few months and soon 1958 would roll around and with this year we would see the end of Adam. Adam would have a very severe case of metal fatigue with cracks in his boiler ever increasing. The procedure to repair metal fatigue is a very risky business as not everyone who undertakes the procedure survives. Adam decided to request the final firing, the process to end an engine's life using black water. Adam would take the black water in the company of Sir Topham Hatt, Diesel, Edward, and Mr. Zorro, peacefully dying. Rest in peace, Adam, 1882 to 1958, age 75. In 1958, the CFR reached the summit of Coley Fell, establishing a station roughly 50 meters below, below the summit of the mountain itself. With Adam's death, Donald was transferred to the Brendan branch line, leaving a vacant space on the main line. Joshua, a Class 42 warship locomotive prototype from BR, arrived on Sodor. He was a good worker, although he had some prejudices around steam engines claiming that he was the future. Another prototype was sent to the Brendan branch, a Class 28 Metropolitan Vickers Type 2 diesel electric. His name was Boko. While Joshua was a success, the experimental engine unit that Boko had that Boko had caused a great deal of grief for the engine. BR would insist that it was just teaming troubles, continuing to put him on progressively longer and longer trains. Joshua would be transferred elsewhere on, on BR's network, so, BR, so Boko was assigned to do the jobs that Joshua had done, that included pulling the express. One day, Boko's engine failed, so Henry had to help him. When they got to Marin, Henry stopped as he had saw an engine from his past hauling an excursion train. That engine was Emily, and it was revealed that night that she and Henry were indeed married. Harriet had occurred on the former GNR when the pair worked together, as they had got a priest to officiate the relationship. Boko's repairs would take longer than expected, so, he, so Emily was temporarily assigned to the main line. After questioning from several of the engines, Sheffield would reveal why he moved so slow as the Baron sta Barrow station pilot. He would tell a story about how the last time he sped, he killed a man back in 1954. Following his story, he would actually finally begin to work back at normal speed, bringing Barrow Station in the yard back to peak efficiency. Bogo would be sent back to the mainland, to the manufacturers, to find out to sort out the faults of the Class 28s, so Emily became a permanent addition to the NWR, an arrangement that, en that Henry and Emily were very pleased with. The Ellsbridge Airport would be up and running by roughly 1958, being an incredibly popular way for people to travel and arrive onto Sodor. Harold would also be brought onto Soto, becoming a part of the fire and rescue service so he could get to accidents faster than Mickey. A class 40 prototype called Fyodor would come to Soto aimed at running the post trains. 
but due to his engine seizing up, his trail failed and Emily was assigned to running the post trains from then on. In the opening months of 1959, a television documentary about Soda was made, detailing how Soda operated. It also mentioned the tale of King Godred and the crown they would grant immortality. This would of course lead to a spate of robberies and vandalism across Sodor. Barry McKinley, brother of Tom McKinley, the former founder and leader of the Sodor British Union, hired Stan and Kenny to dig up a crate. This crate was on the Sean Hainsley estate, a local politician to the area. The, ca the crate contained documents of every single member of the British Union having been hidden during the Second World War. Stan and Kenny thought that they were being led on by McKinley, not being paid for digging up the crate. They decided to rob the post train which had been pulled by Geoffrey. The lucky lamp was on the tracks, stopping Geoffrey and allowing for Old Man Bailey to fight Stan and Kenny. Stan and Kenny were arrested, singing like canaries about their crimes and Barry McKinley, allowing for him to be arrested. The crate was discovered and the documents became public, leading to further arrests across the UK of former British Union members, including various politicians and high-ranking officials. In 1959, the French ambassador would visit Sodor, bringing along his dog, a German shepherd. They would visit the completed China clay pits, but the dog ended up escaping the ambassador. Incidents involving more sheep cropped out around the area, but with help from Bill, the dog was returned to ambas the ambassador and was cleared of any wrongdoing. So that was season 4 part 1, con covering roughly 1955 to 1959. A fairly uneventful season? But it kind of sets the groundwork for some big changes on Sodor. Some of these stories were great, some of them not so. I'd probably give this half season a 7 out of 10. It's, you know, I'm not going to be like jumping back to this anytime soon. We are now in the 1960s, and its first year was quite eventful on Sodor. On the northwest side of the island, an oil processing depot was built at the town of Waterton, intending for oil ships to dock there, transfer the fuel into tanker wagons, and the fuel to be shipped to the mainland. Oliver and Duck were brought to Sodor, becoming the main engines for the new branch line. Construction of the line north from Tivmid by, by passing the mainline at Islesborough went well. This was until Oliver ended up in the turntable well. Because of the gap in the roster, Diesel volunteered to help with the construction as well as to try and repair his reputation with Duck and Percy, both of whom he had, both of whom he had yet to apologise to before now for events that he had done way back in the past. Tensions between the trio would ramp up, reaching a boiling point when Scruffy sang a song to the other trucks that had been sung about Diesel back in 1939. Diesel was outraged by this, and, having, and, and after finding out Duck told him that song, he set out to find the Great Western Engine. He rammed into Duck, who rammed into Percy, causing the cranes to hit various trains at Tidmouth Holt. Diesel would apologise to Percy and Duck at the sheds that night after realising the project was far more important than petty rivalries. Percy and Duck would accept the apology, but Diesel would still receive 30 days incarceration. What is that now? I think, I think he's like, I think he's hit 50, 75 now. Wow, that's a lot of him. On the Scarlowy Railway, expansion was in progress. There was a big rock ridge separating the Scarlowy Railway and the Nartwin Valley. But with the help of Dynamite, this was completed in early 1961. With the ridge opened, the expansion made its way into the valley itself. Rusty was purchased for the Scarlowy Railway to help with the expansion. Needless to say, Duncan took extreme pre prejudice against Rusty on the basis that Rusty was a diesel. The Scarlowy Railway soon reached the famous Standing Stones of Sodor. While at the side, Rusty supposedly saw the Nartwin, a, a Sasquatch-looking creature very large and covered in hair. The Nartwin Express was formed from the multiple sightings frame framed as a Nartwin hunt of sorts. It was very successful, generating a lot of revenue for the railway. The Franks and Son Dynamite Company would keep churning out dynamite for the expansion, but the new supervisor was less than subpar as he had a habit of barely looking at the dynamite that he was tasked with making sure was secure. One day, Andreas was picking up a dynamite train from the company, but his driver was feeling ill. At Andreas's request, his driver went to the hospital, and Andreas ran crewless with his train. The train became uncoupled just beyond the ridge without Andreas noticing. Duncan had been coming up the line when he, de when he had derailed in the gorge, with Rusty putting him back onto the rails. The unattended train exploded due to an improper handling, causing a rock slide. Duncan was unable to move, so Andreas shot forward, pushing Duncan out of the way. But unfortunately, Andreas would be killed by a very large rock. Rest in peace, Andreas, 1916 to 1961, age 45. The expansion continued, and now we have reached the winter of 1961. 
One day, Stuart would forget to secure his tracks at the top of the hill, allowing them to run away and derail on the old iron bridge, plunging down and crushing what was thought to be a young beer cub. The consequences of this accident would end up being quite severe for the Scalari Railway. A workman was killed, and the workman was completely destroyed, but by what? The theories began to range from a beer to a serial killer, but the most common one was that the Nartwin did it. One night, some hunters would w went out to go and kill whatever had been behind the, this attack. Most of them were killed, but one of them was able to escape with the help of Ivor Hu, the pair seeing the creature, albeit from a distance and in the dark. The army would be called in, setting up checkpoints and regular patrols along the Scalary Railway, hoping to capture and or kill the creature that was killing these people. One day, the military were chasing the creature, speeding across the country lanes. Unfortunately for Duncan, the truck was Huck being used crashed right into him, derailing and causing damage to him. He'd be in the works for a long while. The military would blame Duncan for this accident, and with Duncan conveniently having amnesia for forgetting, the, forgetting this incident, he was partially to blame for this. When Duncan didn't return that night, Ivo, Hugh, Scarlowe, Rusty, and Reneus went up the line to try and find him, fearing the, cra the creature had got Duncan. A fog rolled in, and with no hidings from Duncan, the group began to go back down the line when the creature ran in front of them, being chased by Old Bailey. Of course he denied being there, but Rusty and Reneus, who saw it happened, always believed that he had been there that night. The thing about the thing that had been causing mayhem was later revealed to be a beer angry about a dead cub, but not everyone believed that story. By 1962, the Scarlow Railway reached the town of Harwin, completing the, ex the extension up the Nartwin Valley. A few slate crows would be expanded could be constructed around the Nartwin Valley itself. It would be revealed by Benson the Lucky Lamp wasn't any special lamp, just a regular issue ROD lamp. Since it was technically military equipment, Benson confiscated it, and after an investigation, it was found to actually be Benson's headlamp himself, so he returned it back to Stanley as it had been found to be missing on the front lines. There was a boulder of similar shape to the boulder that had blocked the main line back in 1938 at one of the slate quarries. One day, after an onslaught of rain, the boulder fell down to the tracks, chasing after Falcon and Reneus. The boulder would roll down the line until the ha town of Harwin, where it went into a siding and crashed into a train of dynamite, destroying the boulder. Sir Handel and Sir Topham Head were nearby and went to the, ex the accident scene. After a bit of banter, Stanley said that it was lucky no one was hurt in this accident, as he had the lucky lamp aboard his train. So Topham had decided to see about this fabled lamp for the first time, getting quite a nasty shock when he opened up the vans. It was the same lamp that had saved him back in 1917 and indirectly got him sent to the hospital at Carlton, where he had been experimented upon by Wesley Anderson. Needless to say, the repressed memories came flooding back and Sir Topham Hatt left the area really, really quickly. Sir Topham Hatt would be plagued by memories of Dr. Anderson, seeing him when others couldn't. It got so bad that Topham had that Topham's wife recommended him to go to the, her psychiatrist to talk about what had been happening to him recently. Duncan had returned to Scarlowy Railway, sporting a yellow paint livery similar to that of Andreas, raising some questions. One day he would meet a former workman on the Barnhill Railway, Duncan trying to keep it, co keep it quiet. After questioning from some of the engines, however, he would tell the story about how the Barnhill Railway was very corrupt and very unsafe, leading Duncan to adopt the attitude of always being overworked as he had for 30 years. So Topham Hatt would, tell, would go to the old side of the Carlton Hospital, speaking with the ghost of Wesley Anderson. Anderson knew what he had done was the wrong thing, having willingly given up his license and begged for jail back in 1918 when the hospital's secrets were revealed. So Topham Hatt would forgive Anderson for what he'd done, as Anderson had been under orders to find a magic cure or else he would have been fired. And some of the experiments did actually help quite a lot of people. So Topham Hatt wished to have the lucky lamp in his office, but the, but the problem was that the lamp had gone missing. The whereabouts of it were unknown, but fairies surrounded it of where it could have gone. The lamp would never appear on Sodor in the main timeline as of this video. The military on Sodor would downsize their operations, closing Fort Sudrian and migrating up the Nartwin Valley, setting up Camp Coldy near the Harwin Slate Quarry. This was opened in 1962. At the closure of Fort Sudrian, Rosie was expected to be lo relocated to Southampton Docks, but she was purchased by Sir Topham Hatt, much to the delight of James and Rosie. She was reassigned to the Brendan branch. Randolph, the brother of Reginald, would come to the island hauling a rail tour. He volunteered for the tour to see Reginald and hopefully to make amends for about what happened back in London. The story goes that Randolph, who was envious of the praise that Reginald had kept on getting, started a partial rumour that Reginald didn't fancy females. A rumour that back in the 1930s was very, very damaging. 
Randolph was apologetic, but Reginald wouldn't hear any of it. Needless to say, the relationship was very, very rocky. Due to a fault with BR signalling, Randolph would crash into Edward, causing Edward's boiler to crack and putting the engine into a near coma-like state. Randolph would derail the next down a set of points, his own boiler cracking, but unlike Edward, it had been found that Randolph had a severe case of metal fatigue, worse than Adam's case. Reginald tried to save hey, Randolph, requesting Mickey to give Randolph a complete overhaul. Unfortunately, Randolph never woke up, causing a great deal of grief for Reginald. Samantha would try and, uh, and help Reginald overcome the, the grief. Hey, hey, so much so that it was a little shocked when he asked her to marry him. Edward would get a new boiler and would return to regular service, being able to attend the impromptu wedding ceremony. Dr. Wit Dr. Richard Beeching, chairman of BR, would arrive on Soda in 1963. He was notorious for closing down economically unsustainable sections of BR, and on Sodor, various places were closed. These were Carlden Yard, Crosby Yard, Lower Napford Station, and the Oil Depot. Ellsbridge Harbour would also be closed, along with various goods stations that were unprofitable. The Far Cry branch line would end up being the least profitable of all the branch lines on Sodor, so Beeching was expected to close it down. This wasn't good news, not since the another quarry needed a stone crusher that, would, that could only be moved by rail to stay operational. The ends of the Far Cry branch would unknowingly prove to Beeching that the line was useful after, using, after getting the crusher up the line and through the dip, a stretch of track that had been lowered to try and slow runaway trucks from the quarry. This wouldn't stop Beeching from closing the branch, however, with stone trains, but with stone trains becoming more and more profitable, the branches would be designated as an industrial line. This was also done with a bit of persuasion as on top of him had's desk at that time was a copy of the railway series book Branch Line Engines. So so, so Topham had slightly said that he wouldn't want to close down Thomas's branch line. This doesn't make much sense, however, as the book was released in 1961, but Daisy appears in that book. But she's still yet to appear in this series, so I guess life imitates art or will it all do as a time traveller? Barrow Station and yard workers would go on strike, meaning that rail traffic couldn't make its way onto Sodor, now having to come in via sea. Johnny Cuba would arrive at Barrow with a stolen MOD train filled with, with weapons and munitions intending to sell it to the IRA. Unfortunately with the strike, he couldn't unload the train at Barrow, so he had to go to Sodor and unload at the recently closed Fort Sudrian. Joey would have somehow not recognised Johnny Cuba until it was too late, being knocked off the rails by the criminal engine. Johnny Cuba would use odd mind powers to be able to lower down the Vickerstown lift bridge and change the ports, change the points, arriving at the fort. Arthur would somehow end up at the fort, confronting Johnny Cuba. Johnny Cuba would make threats at the engine, convincing Arthur to steal some coal trucks so Johnny Cuba could leave the train at the docks for the IRA to dock and load it, and Johnny Cuba could make yet another escape. The Princess Alice, a large passenger ship, would be damaged at sea and would have to dock at the, at the soon-to-close Altsbridge Harbour. The storm that had been predicted was far worse, then bucketing down dramatically. The passengers from the Princess Alice were relocated across Soda, but with Henry's Tunnel blocks blocking most of the mainline engines, trains were running very full with very few engines to run them. A particularly long train just about stalled on Gordon's Hill, but with the assistance of Arthur, it was able to get over the hill. Arthur would stand up to Johnny Cuba, and with the help of Edward, Johnny Cuba was derailed and arrested. He sang like a canary, giving up a lot of his criminal associates. But then he disappeared for good, with theories about him being deported back to Australia or being executed via black water, but that was the end of him. We have reached 1964, when dieselization began to ramp up dramatically. It started with a new OH shunter for Bower Yard, meaning that Sheffield was reassigned to the Waterton branch. A Class 17 diesel named Derek was the next to arrive, being assigned to the Farquhar branch. However, his engine meant that he couldn't handle gradients above 1 and 100, so then he was reassigned to the Wharton branch. But he would also struggle there. But after an engine repair at the Crovens Gate Works, Derek would then become the secondary fire and rescue engine, a job that suited him perfectly. A Class 46 diesel named Francis arrived shortly thereafter, being assigned to the main line, excelling in his jobs. Unfortunately, his personality was far from excellent, being a very snobbish engine that only wanted to pull the express. A Class 07 named Salty would be assigned to the Brendan branch, excelling as Brendan Docks Hulk Shunter, being a very pleasant chap with many a pirate story to tell. The final diesel to arrive was Daisy, a diesel railcar aimed, at to, aimed to run stop, stopping commuter trains. She was snobbish like Francis, but she learned sense. Francis, however, would fall into a ditch next to the Vickerstown sheds after running off the turntable. 
He would be reassigned after this incident, occasionally coming back to Soda with rail tours and fuel deliveries. Brian, an old brake van from the former Railsworth and Sudbury Railway, would return to Soto, a shock for Edward as Brian had saved his life back in 1915. Brian, of course, is the sole survivor of the Wellsworth and Sudbury. Brian had come in, had come in on a train pulled by Boko, much, a much different engine. He had been at the Crovens Gate Works for a brief bit, the workmen fixing all of his faults, making Boko a strong diesel as he was designed to be. To top the day off, Peter arrived back on Sodor, having served his 15 year sentence. Gordon was very angry at having seen Peter again, so angry that when tensions fired up, the pair had to go and see him Mickey to get down to the, problem, the bottom of this problem. They would resolve their differences about the fact that in war, the circumstances of the incident involving the pair were mutual, with the pair understanding how the other one felt about what, about what they did in certain areas. Godred's Day in 1964 marked the 1000th anniversary of King Godred and Cold of the Tyrant's battle back in, the, back in 964. The Waterton branch would gain two more engines, Wendell and William, giving the reason, reasoning as to why the Waterton branch is better known as the Little Western. To round out 1964, Old Bailey would be approached and arrested by the SCP Foundation, being hinted to be the immortal King Godred. This would explain some things as he had been a fogman on the mid Soto Railway which opened back way in 1882. So, you know, if you add up the years, he would be over at least 120, yet he's still moving around like he's a 70 year old man. I don't know. We also learn here that the Nar twin, otherwise known as Croven, had been, quote, killed by the SCP Foundation in 1961. Wow, that is most certainly a cliffhanger. To make things simple, I'm going to make this next section of the video solely dedicated to the SCPs of Sodal miniseries, as events may or may not have happened. Season 4 Part 2 covered 1960-1964, to and wow was it an improvement, I enjoyed this one a lot. I'd give this season an 8.5 out of 10 if asked. In 964, a major battle between King Godred and Coldy the Tyrant raged, with a man escaping. He would come across a man and a woman within the Standing Stones, clearly out of their time. In 1917, Corporal Pro Kyle Proteus would work with Benson and Stanley on the Western Front, quickly gaining a reputation of being incredibly lucky. One day, as he was taking ammunition to Mont Sabir, a tree in was in the line in front of him and a German shell exploded the train, killing Kyle. Kyle's spirit would levitate to one of the sole surviving objects of that disaster, a solitary lamp. That lamp was of course the lamp that, Mont that Sir Topham had would take back with him back to Sodor. In Australia in 1938, Johnny Cuba would be created with a group of people chanting in an unknown language, and then the group would be struck by lightning at the same time. The engine in the centre of the ritual become non-faceless with supernatural abilities. In 1945, we find out that Peter had a brother, Agent Alan Lang. Alan was expected to take a train in Germany, doing so easily, but a problem arose. Johnny Cuba would use his telepathic powers to disconnect the train, teleport in front of it, and escape with the train, derailing Alan as he, free, as he fled. Over the coming years, Johnny Cuba would go around the world, teleporting in and out of various countries and stealing trains. In 1956, Alan would chase Cuba into a siding, where the latter would later derail, being arrested by the SCP Foundation. But when they put them back on, his, on the rails, he would disappear. The theory proposed was that Cuba got his powers on the rails somehow, so if he was derailed again, he wouldn't be able to disappear. In 1957, on the slopes of Coldy Fell, two hikers would hear a mysterious wailing noise. The noise seemed to originate from a cave with ancient Sudric texts. One of the hikers went into the cave, the wailing noise came again and an entity flew out of the cave. The other hiker ran away, alerting the authorities who would alert the SCP Foundation. The area would be contained and a monitoring station would be set up by the mouth of the, mouth of the cave. Dr. Gwen Hatley would arrive as she had a history of translating ancient texts. She would be greeted by Rodney Pierce. The leader of the Soda branch of the SCP Foundation, Gwen would join with Dr. Angus Murphy to decipher the text on the cave entrance. Gwen would decipher that the text above the cave stated, If life be entered before its time, the dead will return. A group of prisoners known as D-Class was sent into the cave, armed with sensors and radars, but the prisoners would enter and, and entities would fly out. One of the D-Class prisoners was called D-5702, also known as Bobby Cooper. He was centered in the cave, meeting the same face as everyone else before him. The trials would go on and on until in 1958. Gwen would happen to spoke Boko when he was on Sodor the first time, noticing the number D5702. 
She, an army, she and an army officer called Gavin Potter and Rodney Pierce were questioned Boko about his history. Finding out his name was indeed Bobby Cooper. This seemed to support the theory that people who went to the cave came out in either former spirits or as new engines. In 1959, following the arrest of Barry McKinley and the exposure of the British Union, Gavin Potter would come across a piece of paper during one of the arrests, pocketing it and giving it to Gwen. Gwen would translate the text, giving directions starting from the Standing Stones. The directions would lead to a spot that, after a bit of digging, would contain a crate. Inside that crate were diamonds, not just any diamonds, but those that had been stolen by from West Train back in 1901 in South Africa. On the Scarlow Railway, Stanley would say the full name of Carl Proteus next to the lamp, summoning the physical spirit of him, much to the shock of everyone. Gavin and Gwen would witness this, but when Gavin picked up the lamp, Carl would disappear back into the lamp. Following a chat with Carl in the SCP Foundation, Carl would disappear entirely, invading the Foundation and saving those who aren't so lucky. The cave and hiking trails up to the top of Cody Fell were, ban were banned sometime in the 1960s and the SCP Foundation saw no more benefits to the trials, but this didn't stop some people. In 1961, we see the other side of Stuart train, Stuart's train running away and falling off the old iron bridge, seeing as it crushed a Nartwin, who we later found out was called Harwin. Croven, the name of the main Nartwin who would witness this, attacking the Scarlow Railway. The SCP Foundation was brought in and under the guise of being part of the military, tasked with capturing Croven. One day, after a few attacks, there would be a sighting of Croven and the SCP Foundation would give chase. The truck would end up crashing into Duncan, injuring the engine and his crew. Croven would escape. The Foundation would continue to chase Croven, encountering him in the fog. Old Bailey would appear, fighting the military men and allowing for Croven to escape. This would be for nothing, as the next day Croven would be captured the next day. Croven was then supposedly killed, and with that, the Nartwin species went extinct, or so it was fought. In 1963, Cuba would be summoned once again. The ritual to summon Cuba was to kill a family member and then carve the, the letters W-A-G-R into their face. Two men, one of them with a terminal illness, would initiate this ritual, summoning Cuba. Cuba would be tasked by a man to rob the M an MOD train, intending to send it onwards to the IRA. Cuba would take the opportunity of Theodore breaking down and stealing the train. The train was a sting operation though, and soon the military and the railway police would chase after Cuba. Cuba would be chased across the Rossworth Vale region, eventually coming to a bridge. Alan charged at Cuba and a scuffle ensued, but Cuba was too strong and Alan was pushed off the bridge, killing the 8F. Cuba would escape to Sodor, where he was derailed by the Arthur. The Foundation would catch up to Cuba, intending to ship him overseas to their main facility for experimentation. Green water was administered, but due to a mix-up, black water was introduced to Cuba's system, killing the gangster. In 1964, a workman on the Waterton branch would uncover a skeleton in an ancient stone of ancient subject text. The skeleton was thought to be that of King Godred, which would line up with the fact that the stone was known in legend as the Rock of Godred. The rock would lead to the foundation back to the Standing Stones. The text on the rock was partially translated as Open wide the gates of, with the last word missing. After deduction, Angus would find out that the final word was time, opening up the stones and teleporting Gwen and Angus through time. Then encounter a T-Rex, aliens attacking Earth, and a young Jackson Bailey, who knew how to use the Standing Stones. It was revealed here to Gwen and Angus that Old Bailey was actually Coldy the Tyrant, as Fogman and Ancient Sudrick directly translates to Cold D. The Foundation would capture Old Bailey, it being, it being revealed that he would later join them. At that moment, some, someone would come through the Standing Stones, a Mr. Jonathan Starr, known as King Godred. In 1991, Cam Coldy would close down, being hinted to be the SCP's main base on Sodor, but nothing had been proved has been confirmed as of recording. In 2015, after Edward told the story of the path of the dead, a man would enter the cave with the spirit of Dominic appearing on Gordon's Hill in front of Douglas's train. In 2015 as well, after Edward told the story about how fortune favours the lucky, Stanley on the Scarlow Railroad would be saved by a large rock falling onto the tracks by an unseen Kyle Proteus. And finally, in 2015, after Edward told the story of the Nartwin, a Nartwin was won over by a lorry on the Scarlow Railway being witnessed by a tribe of Nartwins. That night, the tribe went to one of the towns, causing absolute chaos by murdering everyone inside. Oh my lord, that was certainly an eye-opener. I personally believe these tales to be canon to the stories of Soda, but I can understand if some of you guys don't believe these to be canon. I can't wait to see if Victor does a season 2 of this in later years, we'll just have to wait and see.
We have one more season to go, folks, and this season has, and this season will be a very dense season as well. Back to SCPs of Sodor, I'd give it a 9 out of 10. Yeah, I'm biased, but I enjoyed it. We have now reached 1965, a year that would change a lot for Sodor, for better and certainly for worse. The water to branch would be, which had been open and been doing war and trade, was hit with a spate of vandalism. Peter would be the target of some of this, having statements and logos put onto his sta onto his tender, symbols that I can't see or show onto YouTube, but did revolve around him being a war criminal. We re we meet Robert Hall, the new superintendent at the Crowvids Gate workshops. He instead instead he remembers seeing Donald when he was a young boy, as his father had been a guard on the former LMS. The turntable at the sheds would be targeted, being jammed with only Jeffrey being able to leave the sheds. He would offer to take the flying kipper for Henry, an act that would doom him. A pipe would be placed on the rails below Gordon's Hill. Jeffrey didn't stand a chance. He hit the pipe and careened down the side of the embankment, killing himself and his crew. Rest in peace, Jeffrey, 1934 to 1965, age 31. Derek, Mickey, and Robert Hall would arrive on the scene, pronounce Jeffrey, pronouncing Jeffrey as dead, with Derek delivering the bad news to the rest of the mainline fleet. The real culprit of Jeffrey's murder would only just be getting started. A road bridge between Soto and the mainland would be completed the day of Jeffrey's death, allowing for increased competition from the roads. Soon, the railway began to lose more and more contracts to the roads. On the Waterton branch, a new lorry was purchased called Onslow. He was very smug about being in service, while the Waterton branch saw trains hands of goods being cancelled left, right, and centre. A new double-decker bus nicknamed Bulgy was brought to the Waterton branch, single-handedly taking most of the passenger traffic by himself. George had been making his way around the islands, destroying the areas that Beechling had closed down in 1963, ending up on the water branch during 1965. George and Oliver had a prior history together, one that ended with a minor accident involving the Piotr level crossing. The next day, in a stroke of, of, a, a stroke of ironic coincidence, Onza would break down on a level crossing. George was behind him. After some minor threatening from Oliver, George decided to rattle the rails and charge at Oliver. Oliver recoupled from his train and charged at George, with obvious results coming from that. Bulgy would end up taking Duck's passengers one day, using a shortcut that he had heard about. Unfortunately, the height of the bridge was lower than the height of Bulgy, with obvious results coming from that as well. George was sent away from Sodor, spending the rest of his days building motorways across the UK. Bulgy was also sent away, his whereabouts unknown at the time of recording, likely turned into a hen house. Onzo would stay on Sodor, having changed his personality, being a far more pleasant chap. With the new road bridge, more people were able to visit the island, so many enthusiasts taking photos of, uh, of the engines by trespassing on the main line. One day, Emily had to stop due to faulty brakes on some of the trucks, and Avery Halifax pulled up and took photos of her. Avery Halifax was rich, so he was able to pay off the coppers and the engine crews to turn a blind eye to his trespassing. Robert Audrey returned to Soto to mark the 20th anniversary of the railway series. He would be a part of a new venture, a ride with the reference train, where he would ride on the express and passengers could do a meet and greet on the go. The trucks up at Marston Heights coal mine had their brakes locked up, so very old trucks were being used for a very important order. Emily was pulling the train up Gordon's Hill one day, when James made his way down with a reverend train. Just before e Emily made it to the top, one of the truck couplings snapped, allowing half the train to roll down the hill. Mr. Halifax would be at the base of the hill, filming, filming James being on the tracks to get his precious photo. James would wish him, covering him in a cloud of steam. Halifax partially blinded, not seeing the runaway train until it was too late. He was killed instantly. Halifax's family would sue the Marston Heights coal mine, leading to its closure, but I'll discuss that a little later. Neil was working at the Kildane scrapyard when one day, a rather odd incident occurred. Neil was told to go to a recently occupied siding and move it to the scrap yard, scrap line. He had bumped into a very rusted engine, awaking it, awaking it from, a very, from an apparent coma. The rusted engine's name was Barry. The records show that Barry had moved around scrap yards across the UK since 1958, ending up in the condition that we see him, him as when we first meet him. Barry would be transferred to the Crovens Gate Works for restoration, with Robert Hall proposing to use the engine for an unusual experiment. Before Barry's overhaul could begin, the alarm rang. Henry had derailed quite severely, killing his crew and greatly damaging himself. His condition would be the equivalent of a of critical in our terms, but the shipment of new parts had been delayed. To keep Henry alive, Robert Hall proposed to use scrap parts to momentarily keep Henry's condition stable. Luck would be on their side, as a soon-to-be-scrapped faceless engine had most of the parts in common with Henry. 
The parts were substituted and Henry would stay in the works as the new parts finally re arrived a few days later. Barry, who was inspired by Robert Hall's work, agreed, decided to, to agree to the unusual experiment that Robert had, wor had, had wanted to attempt. The specifics of that experiment I'll discuss a little bit later. The fallout from Halifax's lawsuit on Marston Heights would end up closing the coal mine. But this would not be the end of the mine, as we're rallying from the, from the town of Marston Heights, it was turned into a heritage railway. Neil, Clive and Matthew would help build the line to be, to be passenger standard, as the line had been industrial prior to 1965 and many fences and gate crossings had to be installed. The three engines would gratefully retire from regular service, running the heritage line by themselves, a far more manageable pace for the over century old engines at this point in time. The line would be renamed to the Marston Heights Coal Railway, or the MHCR for short. Kate would be purchased from the coal mine, eventually being sent to the Waterton branch, but I'll discuss that a little later. Some odd occurrences happened to the former SM engines. Firstly, Matthew would see the ghost of Patrick Clifton, believing him to be real, having conversations with him even though he wasn't really there. Then, Neil had a severe mental breakdown brought on by a case of locomotive dementia, otherwise known as Smokebox Syndrome, no, or SS for short. Clive would tell Matthew the truth, who for allowing for Matthew to stop having visions of Patrick, causing great distress to the engine. Neil and Matthew would be sent to the works where they were cured of their smoke box syndrome, becoming as sharp as they were when they exited Glasgow all those years ago. Once the engines had been repaired and had therapy with engines, with, with Mickey, Neil, Clive and Matthew would be repainted into a new livery on the, of, the MHC, of the MHCR, a re-delivery, opening the line to a great success a few months later. Kate would struggle on the Waterton branch, as since she had been an industrial coal engine before, her way with the passenger coaches were far from desirable. The goods work would be in the same boat, as freight had to be handled delicately, unlike coal trucks. Kate would be momentarily reassigned to the Farquhar branch, where under the teachings from Toby, she was able to learn how to properly operate passenger trains, and by extension, goods trains. Up at the end of Quarry, following the retirement of Clive, his replacement would be purchased. The Class 04 diesel was called Mavis, and she was, well to put it simply, inexperienced with the shunting work. The quarry was soon in a right state, with the trucks being haphazardly placed everywhere with no order. Percy would soon refuse to get the trains, leading to Mavis attempting to take the train from, quarry, from the quarry to Farquhar. The, tra the trucks with the pipes appeared to be of the old way of the Westinghouse pi brake pipe, how air pressure was required to activate the brakes for some reason. Anyway, some of those brake pipes failed, causing Mavis's fully loaded train to become a runaway. Toby, who would be coming up the line to talk to Mavis about a way of handling the crow, was able to stop Mavis with the help of the dip. It was revealed in an investigation by Mickey that the trucks should have engaged their brakes, but due to damage from heavy shunting, they couldn't work. Mavis would then accept help from Toby to help run the crow efficiently, as she finally understood that her method wasn't the greatest. Soon the crow was running back at the most, at the most efficient pace it had ever run at. Kate would be reassigned to the Waterton branch, as she, having become an experienced engine on the Farquhar branch, she would be repainted into a green livery to match the other engines on the Waterton branch. With the Marston Heights coal mine closed, coal had to be imported from the mainland. Francis handled these trains, much to his disdain. It would be revealed that when he arrived to hire with one of his trains, it was actually designed by Robert Hall himself. Barry would exit the works, being a far different engine. The experiment called Steam Diesel Conversion, otherwise known as SDC, Made diesel made Barry look like a steam engine, but operate like a diesel engine, much to the other engine's shock. SDC worked by using a diesel electric motor that powered the driving wheels with fuel coming from oil stored in the tender. The trials would be commenced with diesel having to pace himself as the heat of a standard firebox is far greater than the heat that can fry an engine, much to his displeasure. One day Barry would take a train for Donald, as Donald had been feeling unwell. This would be the straw that would break the, town, the camel's bag, as his engine would fail at the base of Gordon's Hill. Once the kinks were ironed out, however, BR would adopt the SDC conversion initiative for non-faceless vehicles as efficiency improved, but the running and maintenance costs were lower. This process would be called the overhaul. It is revealed that later that Edward would later have the overhaul, but no specific date is mentioned. So Tom had found out that Peter had had been the only engine on the main line to have never pulled coaches, and so for a change of pace, Peter was assigned to a stopping train from Napford to Vickerstown. Francis was very annoyed by this, telling Peter that a man, Luther von Haas, was, was searching for him. As his, as his family had been in the hospital in Germany back in 1945, much to Peter's shame. Peter was miserable, and although he pulled the train successfully in a montage of great camera pans and, and sweeps, he had become depressed. At Vickerstown, he would go to the water tower, a move that would end his life. 
Luther von Haas would be at the Vickers town sheds and armed with an old German pistol would fire three shots into Peter and combined with Peter's undiagnosed mental fatigue would kill the ATF. Rest in peace Peter, 1935 to 1965, age 30. At the scrapyard, Mrs. Orr would, would appear to make his final respects. It would be revealed in a flashback to 1939 that with Michael gone, the bills of the Creedies had increased dramatically, leading the mother to kill herself. One of the boys would find the body and steal the gun. In 1965, that same hame boy would use the same gun to kill the man that he found personally responsible for his mother's death, Mr. Zorro. Rest in peace, Nigel Zorro, 1890-1965, age 75. The following night, the same man who killed Mr. Zorro would sneak onto the Scarlowy Railway. At, at a train outside Frank's and Son Munition Factory, he would, he would place a device inside one of the crates of dynamite, an action that would lead to one of the darkest periods of Seudel's modern history. Although Fort Sutton had been closed for several years, military ships still occasionally docked on Seudel, docking it either in Bre Brendam or Knapford. However, one day, the HMS Krakatoa would dock at Brendam, with the unloading and loading process being a general frenzy with munitions and explosives being loaded. Benson would act as general military hard-nosed self, ordering everyone to do everything. He would berate Francis and Thomas one day at, at Wellsworth, as Francis had been on the verge of a breakdown and Thomas was just lounging around. Thomas would take some fuel to Wellsworth and Brendam, an action that would have unforeseen consequences for himself. <laughs> at Crovin's Gate, Diesel and Eric would pick up a shipment from the Scarlowy Railway, and the explosive munitions being loaded onto their trains. The pier would depart for Brendam, and with that, the scene is set. Let the fireworks begin. Ben sort of bumped into a train that was being unloaded, setting off a device that had been placed in one of the crates by an unknown man. The device would create a chain of reaction that would start a fire and explode the train, catching the fully loaded Krakatoa on fire and killing Benson. Rest in peace, Benson, 1911 to 1965, age 54. Mickey and Derek would try to work quickly to extinguish the fire. However, a fireball from the fiery Krakatoa landed on Thomas's fuel tanker, catching it alive. Thomas would bravely reverse out of Brendan with the tanker. He would try to get away with it when it exploded. Thomas and his crew would not survive. Rest in peace, Thomas, 1905 to 1965, age 60. Robert Hall would attempt to save Thomas, but the damage was too severe. While the cleanup was in progress, Toby would connect the fact that Benson pumping the, pumping the train and the catching of the fire happened way too quickly to be an accident. The final death toll from the Brendan Blasts were, were, total, nah, were total 56. At the scrapyard, live ammunition was found. Mickey, to Donald, Toby and Derek attempted to flee the scene, but Donald's valve gear jammed. Mickey then sacrificed himself, putting himself in the explosion, killing him. Rest in peace Mickey, 1912 to 1965, age 53. Because Kildane's scrapyard was damaged and with Bar Harrow scrapyard overloaded, Thomas was sent to Barry Island. Francis would take Thomas, uh, as all of the other engines, big and small, paid their respects. Mr. Zorro's murder case had revealed some new details as the bullets matched those found at the murder of Gregory Hall back in 1960 and Angela Creedy in 1938. Donald would finally connect the dots, assuming that it was Robert Hall, formerly Robert Creedy, who had caused all these revenge attacks. Donald would angrily accuse Robert Hall. But he would reply with the fact that Donald had to, that Robert had strong alibis during every accident. Donald would then realize that it was Sean Creedy who had caused all this. At the former Creedy residence, Sean Creedy would break in. He would see hallucinations of his mother's suicide. Armed with his father's revolver, he would kill himself right there and then, ending the madness. Robert would denounce his brother, and and while there were still rumors about how Robert could have helped with some of the accidents. That didn't stop him marrying and having two beautiful daughters. Sort of recover from 1965, and with the future on the horizon, things were gonna things were gonna most certainly change for the better. But those stories are for another day. Yeah, I finally said it. In 2015, Edward would tell all the stories from his times from 1934 to 1965, with sprinklings of lore throughout to the early years, as well as a few stories that may or may not have happened. Okay, wow, what an ending. I know some people online didn't particularly like this series because of the short pacing and other nitpicks, but I really enjoyed this. I'm always a sucker for when an event 20 years ago becomes relevant into like a future season. Really keeps you on your toes about what to note down. I can't deny that this season was actually really well made, so I'd give it probably an 8 out of 10. 
And with that, we are finally done with the Stories of Sodor timeline, at least up to 1965. And wow, this took a long time to make. And judging by the video length that I can see here, this is where I'll end the video, because Victor is still making his series. I might come back here when the show catches up to himself in 2015, but we'll have to wait and see. For anyone who wishes to make something like this, go for it. I'm not holding any copyright or any of that other stuff. You do how you want to do it, okay? I just... I just did it like this, and granted it did give me a very, very, very long video. So if you want to like condense it down to your own self, go for it. If you've made it this far, thank you. I guess you may as well like subscribe, like, share, comment, you know, do the things that YouTube tells you to do if you enjoy this type of content. This is TW Mallard 38 signing off for now. Have a good one, folks. More content is on its way, but I will have to take a break because this video was a pain. Anyway. Goodbye.